Listeners, past, present, and future, this is Haddonfield Radio. Today, for this special extended episode, we are broadcasting live from The Urge, WURG 94.9 FM studios in downtown Haddonfield. Here at Haddonfield Radio, we offer a fan commentary, deep dive exploration of the history, lore, and legacy of every film in the Halloween franchise, featuring everybody's favorite moldy masked multiversal madman michael myers we are your hosts i'm christian white and i'm joe francasio by the time the third film of the halloween trilogy was primed for release the anticipation within the horror community was at an all-time high the first two films had been commercial success stories and the burgeoning mythology found within the film's continuing narrative had left horror fans desperate to find out what would happen next to the now iconic characters such as the masked serial mass murderer Michael Myers and the enduring survivor of his relentless violence and trauma, Laurie Strode. So, as the third film's reels began to unspool in cinemas around the world, Theaters full of Halloween fans began to see exactly what the highly anticipated third chapter had to offer. And as those very same theaters began to empty as the credits rolled, it was very clear that the undeniable anticipation for the new film had morphed into a communal sense of confusion, distaste, and outright anger. It was October 22, 1982. And that film was Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Almost to the day, 40 years later, a very similar sequence of events was playing out. This time across both packed multiplexes and in living rooms on the Peacock streaming app. It was October 14th, 2022. And Halloween ends, the third film and concluding chapter of David Gordon Green's wildly successful Halloween trilogy was premiering around the world, and franchise fans' excitement was at an all-time high. The promise of witnessing the final confrontation between Laurie Strode and her lifelong nemesis Michael Myers had fans in a frenzy. And yet, as the first screenings of the film played to packed theaters of horror fans, the reaction, much like Halloween 3, was not exactly what the hard-working creators of the film must have been hoping for. 2022, much like 1982, was hands down an absolute banner year for horror. In fact, it was inarguably one of the best years for horror in decades. Films like Ty West and Mia Goth's horrifying and brilliantly acted one-two punch of X and Pearl, Scott Derrickson's darkly compelling The Black Phone, Luca Guadagnino's cannibalistic love story Bones and All, David Cronenberg's return to esoteric body horror Crimes of the Future, Christian Taftrup's beguilingly disturbing Speak No Evil, Radio Silence's return to form requel Scream, Mimi Cave's intense and tonally daring Fresh, and Alex Garland's divisive and sinister Kubrickian horror fable Men all found their way to screens during this one amazing year. And they were all bookended by two certifiable horror genre blockbusters, Zack Kreger's Barbarian and Parker Finn's Smile. However, aside from this absolute embarrassment of riches for genre fans, One independent film flew in under the radar and stole the proverbial show, and the narrative surrounding its production and unanticipated mega-success became the story of the year for horror fanatics. Damien Leone's indie horror film Terrifier was a modest word-of-mouth success upon its release in 2016. 
The film was a crowd-funded gore fest with a psychotic and silent black and white maniac at its center who was called Art the Clown. While Terrifier was by no means a perfect film and certainly had its detractors, no one could argue that its main character, Art the Clown, was brilliantly designed and instantly iconic. Six years later, Leone released his epic horror sequel, Terrifier 2, and the $250,000 budgeted film became a relative mega-success, earning over $15 million at the box office with almost no traditional marketing. The muscular box office of the nearly homemade, crowd-funded film even became a national news story, and the movie, an improvement over its predecessor in almost every conceivable way, wore its horror heart on its sleeve, bizarrely charming fans with buckets of blood and more unrelenting gore than nearly all the other horror films of the year combined. Terrifier 2 proved that Damien Leone was the real deal, and that his maniacal creation, Art the Clown, could stand shoulder to shoulder comfortably with the horror icons of the past, Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, Leatherface, and of course, Michael Myers. By October of 2022, after a relentless year of horror hits, Halloween Ends had started to feel like a bit of an outlier. Pre-release buzz out of advanced screenings had left something to be desired, and the overwhelmingly critical word of mouth seemed to put a damper on expectations. Halloween franchise die-hard fans had been geared up to expect a balls-to-the-wall final confrontation between The Shape and Laurie Strode but were instead served a melancholy and inarguably meandering portrait of a conflicted central character named Corey Cunningham, a character who hadn't even appeared in the preceding two films and who was played by a near-unknown actor by the name of Rohan Campbell. In an October 19, 2022 interview with Variety, Rohan Campbell candidly shared an anecdote about something David Gordon Green shared with him regarding the film they were about to embark upon. Quote, when David offered me the role, he was like, I need you to know that a lot of people are going to be really, really, really unhappy with what we're choosing to do here. You'll probably hear a lot of that. Jamie Lee Curtis reached out and said the same thing, unquote. Upon its release, it appeared that David Gordon Green's self-effacing prediction about his own film had, in fact, come to pass. The backlash was real. However, the film did have many ardent supporters, myself included, who could see how every single theme that had guided the dark heart of the entire franchise was focused through the prism of the character of Corey Cunningham. And through him and his twisted character's evolution, evil changed shape. But one thing remained evergreen, and that was the film's continued dominance at the worldwide box office, opening to a sturdy $41 million and grossing $105 million against a modest $33 million production budget. Finally, 40 years after Halloween 3 had its initial theatrical release and had suffered the indignity of a tepid fan response, it is now hailed as both a true cult classic and a beloved addition to the Halloween saga. Some go as far to say, again myself included, that Halloween 3 is one of the very best chapters of the franchise's storied history and embrace its differences as strengths. I, for one, truly hope it won't be another 40 years before fans can see and accept that Halloween Ends is not just a worthy addition to the franchise that we all have loved for nearly 50 years, but truly the absolute proof that this indelible franchise can continue on into a bright, and creatively limitless future. Joe, here we are, 13 films in, 13 episodes in, which absolutely blows my mind and staggers me. And I have to ask you, on behalf of everyone listening, what did you think, generally, of 2022's Halloween Ends? Uh, well, I think this is where we are finally going to be on very... <coughs> polar opposite 
ends of the spectrum in our, our opinions uh, of one of the Halloween movies. Which has not happened. I mean, it's happened many times uh, we, we, Well, I mean, we've disagreed, I think, in, about uh, uh, parts of. But in general, we're, we're generally, I feel like, on the same page. Okay. Maybe H2O is a little bit of an exception. Right, right. But uh, I think in terms of... Um, this movie, I am definitely on the side of, uh, huh? You know? Um, okay. Uh, and and also just disappointment. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I think David Gordon Green is a great filmmaker. I think this movie is a well-made movie. There's a lot of good I will talk about about it. Um, and I'm, and once we get to the movie, I've promised myself to do that. Like, I'm just going to talk about, I, I won't just hop on all the, 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 the obvious negative stuff that so many have already said. Uh, I, I'm only going to bring it up here in my intro, but I definitely fall in the camp of, um, not that I can't see what he was doing, but I just really think it was some odd choices for this particular chapter. And I just walked away not feeling satisfied, um, uh, with what what they did. Well, let me ask you this. Something that occurs to me, and I sort of covered it a little bit in the intro, is do you think that some of that uh, kind of malaise that you felt from this movie could have anything to do with the way the film was marketed in the way that the, 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 the events of the film that were promised to, to, to fans in the marketing in, 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 versus what you actually got when you saw the movie? Did that have anything to do with it? I don't know. I, I know... Now, when I go and watch the trailers, and I hear, I know how they, and then I've done my research for this for this episode. So in that, I learned about all the test screenings and how many changes were made due to those test screenings. Right. So I know these trailers are being made with them having the knowledge that uh, people are disappointed that it's taking so long to get to Michael, and, and and that whole love story is throwing them off. That they had to market it almost. They almost give you the whole fight in the, in the trailers, like the it, well, like that was like it, the entire marketing of the movie. right. So they I the think posters, they, the trailers, they knew everything. They had to push that to get people in the seats, right? And and hopefully they were gonna fall in love with the love story. I mean, David Gordon Green keeps saying over and over that kills was his action movie and ends is his love story movie. Um, that's that's what he wrote. I mean, so. And in my research, I really tried to, to find, I, you know, I listened to the commentaries, I, I read interviews and between him and the producers and writers, and although they all acknowledged that they were, that they knew that they were making a bold choice in kind of diverting everyone from Michael for 40, almost 40 minutes of the movie before you really get there, um, I have yet to hear anyone explain why that is satisfactory or that sounds like there was more than just a desire to go off the rails right i right. don't i don't i don't i don't see why this is this is the last chapter they 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 there's obviously a culmination they also know that they're gonna you know kill michael off there was also a lot of talk that 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 laurie was gonna die at the end of this one for a while um when they were making it it was that was a real kind of change that was happening almost last minute and and yet they decided to kind of just go in this other direction and i'm all for bold choices and i i think that um uh, you know everyone involved with uh uh, this new love story, Rowan. Uh, oh, he's a great actor. Every, every yeah, I, everything I, I was totally executed agree. well. Yep. Don't get me wrong. No, I totally agree. But but it, I think I don't know if it's an effect that they could they can anticipate or not. But that idea that when you're watching the movie, no matter how good of what you're presenting is, if it's so uh, different than when people are expecting that you're distracted by that, you can't even take in the what's good about what they're showing you because you're going what are we doing here why aren't we with michael what's up with this kid and you know um then uh, you kind of you haven't really done your job i feel like and, and, and you know that's it that's a, that's a hot take there i i but i see where you're coming from and, and you know it's one of those things with this movie is every every bit of criticism i read i i can 
for the most part, I can understand. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not like blind to people's reservations about this film. Like, I'm not. I have said numerous times over these episodes that, like you were saying a minute ago, I'm I'm a really big fan of bold swings, especially in creative storytelling. And I really appreciated that David Gordon Green and his team found a less obvious way of funneling the themes, especially of his trilogy, but really the themes of the entire franchise, through an unusual lens in this film, an unusual almost what feels almost like a side story or a tangential story in terms of the trilogy that David Gordon Green was was creating. However, ultimately, I think it was the right path because what I think it does is it allows for the to to demonstrate the potential of what you can do with this franchise going forward. That you can step out of the comfort zones that have already been established so steadfastly in previous films, in previous timelines and narratives, you can step out of the, that realm and still create compelling stories that exist within the mythology of these movies. And I think that that might have been the, 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 uh, the, the torch that David Gordon Green was attempting to pass with Halloween Ends. Now, again, whether he's successful in that, well, it's, it's so subjective. It, my opinion or your opinion or any of your guys' opinion listening, every, oh, we're all going to have a different opinion even if you see it similar to me or similar to Joe or otherwise or completely on your own. So it's, it's just a subjective fan-to-fan response but as a creative artist David Gordon Green in my opinion was creating something that was quite uh, artistically compelling with this movie so and as we get into the the fan commentary section of this episode you know I'll explain that more in depth my feelings on it but I don't know I, I really have a a lot of issues with the way the film was marketed again yeah I, it, I just think the film sort of if you went into this film based solely on the trailers even the posters the commercials I think you would have felt like you had the rug pulled out from underneath you yeah and, and I I understand everything you're saying about the torch being passed but I think it would have been better suited as a middle in the middle chapter Right, right. Yeah, so, I, I, I get right, that. Leave, yep. leave fans with the 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 taste in the mouth in the, in their mouths that they want. You know what I mean? Right. They kind of give. If you want to diverge, and that's great. And it, yes, I understand. They're they they're trying to show the bigger effects of the evil, and how it can in you know inhabit and get into other people. How, like and, like they say, like how evil changes shape. Mm -hmm. But. You know, then I think it, I think it would have been a little better to to end up with in the last movie, giving fans a a, a bigger showdown with Laurie and Michael, and you know, I don't know, I'm not crazy about the, the trash compactor bit uh, at the end either, but um, I you know, so well, and we'll get there as we talk well, about the movie, listen. but yeah, I don't know, it's it's so hard, you like, but it's a good, it's a it's. I don't want to just trash it. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, even though I do kind of feel, fall in the camp of, of um, the people who, who were disappointed by the overall thing, I do think there was some clever writing, clever filmmaking, amazing effects, great acting, um, awesome music. You know, as a film, it is still entertaining for me to oh, watch. It's, it's a solidly you know? produced and film. I, and I think you are totally right that I, that as time goes on, it's probably going to be accepted. Oh, I, I as, guarantee that. As the 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 the, the disappointment dissipates. I guarantee that. I mean, it's only been a year. Yeah. Out of all the movies we've we've covered, you know, we. It's funny when I first got here to Joe's house to record this. One of the first things Joe said to me was, "Isn't it weird that this movie only was released a year ago? Literally, when we started Haddonfield Radio, yeah. the the month we started was the month Halloween Ends was released. Yeah. And, and I remember even in episode one, we I think we actually said during the episode well i cannot wait a yeah. year from now to be able to talk I, I about think this I was like movie a, i think i was a little angry i think i was like yeah, i hated it and i can't wait to talk about well, it when I, the first now, day i ever asked you about this film like literally the day after it premiered on peacock i i i watched it at home on peacock i have to admit but i i i texted joe well what did you think and his exact text back was i hated it <laughs> I, I, I legitimately well, remember that. That was my the initial... That's what I mean. Like, that was the initial taste it left in my mouth. It, it, I was so distracted by what is going on. What just happened? 
All right, now I can watch it. It's been a year. I've watched it a few times. I, I, I understand a lot more. I see what they're doing a lot more. I just still am curious why they thought this would work as the, the, you know, the period at the end of the sentence. Well, look, let me just say this. One of my favorite writers of all time is named Alan Moore. He created a lot of legendary comics like Watchmen, From Hell, etc. And he said once a very interesting quote that's always stuck with me in terms of looking at art and looking at films, books, TV shows, just narrative storytelling in general. And he once said, uh, a good storyteller gives an audience what they want. A great storyteller gives an audience what they need. Right. And I've always thought that that was so brilliantly stated. And I think it really, for me, in my opinion, and this is just me, and, and, and there's a lot of vitriol when it comes to this movie. And, and Joe and I both, Joe even said to me before we started recording that he had a concern that the comment section was going to get, you know, going to get rough on this one. And because it certainly gets that way on our Instagram page comment sections when we talk about Halloween ends. Because people have very, very, prof had a, a lot of profound feelings about this film, whether they're positive or negative. But... Uh, well, the thing is, I think he, you know, when you compare it to Halloween 3... The, the, the big difference is there, Halloween 3 wasn't carrying the burden of everyone knowing this was going to be the end of this giant thing, and most likely the, the end of Jamie Lee Curtis's journey, you know, as Laurie, no I, matter I, it, how many yeah. more movies are going to get made. So, I, for right or for wrong, there were bigger expectations put on David Gordon Green's shoulders and but I think the illusion that I was trying to make there is that both of these films as third films in a series, right? Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, and Halloween Ends. They both were sort of bogged down by the weight of their own expectations. But, but, but do you think... All right, one, I love David Gordon Green. Let me I just do say too. that. I but, do too. But do you think he tried a little too hard to make this like H3... By by doing all this, like he, you know what I mean? Is it coincidence or was well, I it think if by anything, intention? I mean, we'll talk he, about more he, about this as we he, go. But he he definitely loves to emulate and call back and everything else. But it was almost like he was really trying to. Well, if anything, I think this was his stealth remake of actually John Carpenter's Christine. Well, oh that, yeah. We're, yeah. I was going to talk about that. This and is we'll just get into Christine. That. We'll definitely get into that. Heavy, heavy, heavy. There's so much. Obviously, and all fans know there's a lot of Christine uh, in this movie. Yeah. And that David Gordon Green had pursued the ability to remake Christine at a certain point. Yeah. And it didn't pan out. And I think a lot of the ideas that that team was going to funnel into that remake or that adaptation of the Stephen King novel and remake of the John Carpenter film definitely funneled their way whether it was consciously or not and I'm sure it was consciously into this screenplay and this story now I'm also curious I wonder so obviously there was a big change that was made when you when you watched the deleted scenes for kills the ending of kills Instead of it ending with, you know, with Michael, Laurie saying I'm so, coming to so, get you so originally the idea was you know for it to pick up Continuing to pick up on that night with a big showdown between Lori and then they said, whoa, 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 we have this other idea. And and they kind of changed ge uh, gears there. So I also have to wonder, at, at around the same time now, they're starting pre-production for The Exorcist. And, um, and by the time they're even doing the commentary tracks for ends, they are referencing themselves how into the exorcist they are they are yeah they are they, at, this at that point. point their mind is now on to the so next thing yeah. i have to wonder if this idea of possession which is prominent in this movie is, is you know what i mean yep. is in their heads because they're also in starting this be in this world of the exorcist because personally yes, they i do. think it's probably coincidental because they would have had these notions well before they were developing I know. that yeah, that's true I, but, I, but but you never know i don't know what their development schedule was sure, pre-production sure. wise or writing wise for the exorcist uh believer and and, and the so I, it could be the idea though that also the if you're talking about how the they're widening the ability to tell more stories by the idea of the evil kind of spreading and be going to other people 
but it didn't really work out for uh, for Corey, right? It's not like it got to him and he became the next like super killer. I well, mean, I, it, I think, it, and, and it, again, I think one of the big, my biggest, probably my biggest fault with this movie, if I had one major negative from the first time I saw it until now, one of the aspects of this film that continues to jab me and make me feel aggravated is killing off Corey. Yeah. I think it was a fundamental mistake in the storytelling. And who am I? I mean, I'm just a... F this is just... L listen. This is just from a fan's perspective. I'm not suggesting that I'm a better storyteller or I have any sort of better knowledge than the people who, who did a brilliant job of, of creatively putting this whole movie together, okay? Whether you love the movie or not, there's people who put their heart and souls into making this movie to the best of their abilities. And I have tremendous respect. As somebody who has tried to make films, Joe and I both, even at our level, we know it's, it's, it's so difficult to make a film. Okay, to make a film for a mass audience is even more difficult. It's, in, in, you know, impossibly difficult. So I have tremendous respect. But from my sense of storytelling, I would not have killed off Corey because I think Corey had a great um, amount of potential going forward. But then again, David Gordon Green's telling a, a, a beginning, middle, and end trilogy of story. Now, I wonder, what if they had introduced Corey in one of the earlier films? That's what I'm saying. L like the way they it, introduced it, it, other characters in earlier films that appear later in other so films. So, I think Kills would have been perfect. I know it's not the right, the, in the timeline it's different, but just that would have been a great time to diverge while we're also getting this very intense... Uh, you know, version right, of Michael. Right, yep. um, the, I think the problem was telling that love story while not getting much Michael. I, I think if you were could cut that in with more of Michael. I mean, come on. I mean, people. You know, it's well. It's I think the old the, thing. Yeah. I mean, when you yeah. don't show Michael, it, uh, I mean. It, 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 I think a lot of people's asses are in the seats for Michael Myers. I mean, yeah, I, I hate to bring it down to such I, 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 I a one-dimensional type of thinking, but these are again. No, but we're I not think talking it's true. about. I think these it's are absolutely horror true. Horror movies that that give a fan something they don't usually get, which is the ability to to kind of root for the killer. Right? Yeah, and, I agree. Right, so that's why we're there. I'm not. I'm not. In in many I'm not ways, Michael rooting for Lori. I love her, and I love her. Her. Her, exactly. her character, but and, and, and I mean, I want you know, I'm I'm kind of rooting for, her, but I what I what I want to see is what Michael is doing within that relationship with. Laurie. Well, I think in many ways, especially in this uh, trilogy, and I think even going back through the franchise's you know foundational period, in a weird way, Michael Myers is the protagonist of these films. Yeah, and you are meant to subjectively follow Michael Myers from the very beginning of Halloween 1978 you are literally behind the eyes of Michael Myers John Carpenter is literally putting you behind the mask of Michael Myers yeah. in, in suggesting to you subliminally and even consciously that in a way you're supposed to be subjectively following this story from Michael Myers perspective mm -hmm. in these films one of the major components of the Halloween franchise is subjective perspective storytelling and this film diverges from that in a way and puts you behind the eyes of Corey. But because you haven't had any connection to him in any of the other 12 films, but especially in the two films that preceded Halloween Ends, Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills, I think it was a tall order mm -hmm. to switch that perspective. And I think the majority of people that were there to see this movie, whether it was in the theater or on the Peacock Act, app wanted to continue the story of Michael and wanted to see the confrontation between Michael and Lori. But ultimately, I think what David Gordon Green was doing with his trilogy is telling a story about the consequences of trauma. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And, and, and I think in that, in that, f philosophically, I think that the way he utilizes those themes in Halloween Ends to me is very successful. And I think it's the way forward. And, but I do believe, after going through all these movies, and I will put myself out by saying this, put myself out there, I don't think you can make a Halloween movie going forward without Michael Myers. I think that is something that's been proven. Right, right. If you want to, I think it is time to move past Laurie Strode. It's time to move past Dr. Loomis. It, it, the way forward, I don't. I think that mythology has had its beginning, middle, and end, and I think now it needs to rest 
as the legacy in the foundation of this franchise. But 30, 40 years from now, I think you could continue movies with this. But I think you do need Michael Myers at its center. But I think it's time to place Michael Myers within a brand new mythology. That's just my thought going forward. I mean, what do you think? I honestly don't know. I think it's it's a, it's almost like one of those impossible you know, questions. Even even t even making this movie, it's you know, I don't know if there would have ever been a satisfactory way to end the story to, uh, well, to fans. Well, especially since everybody knows you know it's know not I mean? really the end. Well, yeah, I mean, exactly, right? So Blumhouse now has lost the rights after this movie, and it goes back to the Akkads. And, you know, and don't tell can, me yeah. they're not going to no, no. leave it. I bet no. literally right now I guarantee they're you. looking at treatments and talking to writers and saying, hey, what else can we do here? Uh, my fear is that of the, they're going to do the old prequel Michael in the asylum with a young Dr. Loomis and which is just you know, to me feels something very, like it that. It just feels very depressing to me. Yeah, I, if Michael's I, not out on the loose. I mean, he, you might be able no, to sneak in some creepy that. stories. I, but I, we I don't said know. last time how much it would be great to see a movie set completely within the walls of Smith's Grove. Yeah, yeah. Like an entire film inside Smith's Grove. All right, so yeah. I, I, we both said that would be great. So it's not that, but I really hope they leave some of these legacy characters as legacy characters and as foundational characters that that can inspire new stories yeah. i don't think there's any more you know that th story you can wrench out of laurie strode <laughs> no I and, and, and all the time on instagram i see people fantasy casting who's going to play laurie strode next who's going to play dr loomis next i i just can't i just cannot I can't vibe with that. I'm sorry. I just can't. However, it does sort of fit the mold of what Hollywood does nowadays. They wait a few years. They uh, look at what they what franchises they own. What can we and, and remake re and represent and package to I know. the fans again? The sad again. thing about the reaction to Halloween ends is that potentially I think that they're going to go back to what works. Right. And, and and even though this movie did make money and is a profitable film, and this it, it made the least amount though out of his trilogy. But it's still very oh, profitable. Oh, 100 million out of a 33 million and dollar budget. And that's just theatrical. No, nobody can be disappointed by that. But they but the reviews did not leave. No. You know. No. <laughs> a I, great. I, I I I agree. And so it, unfortunately, I think that from a a, 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 a a financial or a, a strictly cynically financial or marketing perspective going forward I think the you know the money making perception would be to go back to exactly what works yeah exactly what they think fans want and unfortunately I think that is is very clearly what could make what could kill this franchise right and a lot of great franchises and there are some out there that are going on right now that that just cannot grow up that just cannot evolve because of the the amount of bankability they have as they work traditionally and so the idea of going out on a limb is is not a good juxtaposition when it comes to how are we going to make money and how are we going to wring dollars and cents out of these intellectual properties but i will say i did come up with a couple uh, ideas for a few directors that personally i think would be some uh, directors the Akkads could look at or whoever they sell the distribution rights to, whatever studio it goes to, should look at uh, going forward. Can I throw a couple of them Let's out there? It. Let's hear it. All right. Now, this is in no particular order. I just sort of listed a few directors I think would make an interesting Halloween film. All right. How about Mike Flanagan? Mike Flanagan, guy who makes incredible films thematically about... Uh, towns, small towns, communities. You know, think about Netflix series Midnight Mass, which is like got that that kind of Haddonfield, sm uh, cursed small town feel. I think he would deftly handle a Halloween film. Not to mention his movie Hush, which is an incredibly proficient slasher film. Mm -hmm. If you have you ever seen that mm -hmm. Hush, it's a great film. Uh, another one I had was David Robert Mitchell. First of all, he has three names, just like <laughs> David Gordon Green. So there you go. That's enough. But actually, if you think about his film, It Follows. It oh, Follows yeah. almost feels like a John Carpenter film from another dimension. Yeah. Like a John Carpenter film that John Carpenter never made in this reality. That's what It Follows feels like. So he, he has that 2, 3, 5 to 1 aspect ratio down pat, and he's got that, that framing that of traditional... 80s and 70s John Carpenter films had. Another one is a director that's really been big in, in horror circles right now, 
uh, just hitting, you know, just, and, and he's very versatile, and that's Ty West, who I mentioned in my intro, who made, uh, just in 2022 alone, he made X and Pearl. And his, uh, he has the, the trilogy capper, Maxine, coming out this year. And I should say that was also made with Mia Goth. You, you can't understate how important Mia Goth was to those films, but I could see the two of them brainstorming an incredibly interesting Halloween film. Another one that's a little out of left field is, is uh, uh, Karen Kusama, who made The Invitation, uh, and she made this amazing film called Destroyer. If you guys haven't seen that, you should look it up. Uh, she's another one that has a very John Carpenter feel to her filmmaking, and I think would bring a very fresh, interesting female or feminine perspective to a Halloween film. There's never been a female director in any of these films. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying it's time to, to have a female perspective just because that's the era we're living in. But I think it could, be, it could bring a fresh take to things. And finally, someone that I think really would make a strong, traditional... Halloween film, like going back to the traditional, if you were going to, even though I just said I really wouldn't want to see this, but if you were <laughs> going to make a standard traditional Halloween film, what about Fetty Alvarez, who made Don't Breathe, oh, who yeah, made yeah. Uh, the 2013 version of Evil Dead? Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually yeah, think... Yeah, if, if, if he took that more of that approach. If, if you were going to do... Like, if he could do with Halloween yeah. what he did in 2013's Evil Dead for exactly. the Evil Dead franchise, yeah. well, I think in, a, in terms of it being a traditional Halloween film, well, he would be the perfect guy. And he has such an excellent uh, handle on horror. And like Ty West, like I said, he's very versatile. And he's, and he's a very interesting filmmaker with an interesting kind of flair, like almost an international flair. A lot of his films remind me of that, that French New Extremity films. Or even somebody like, this wasn't on my original list, just popped in my head, Eli Roth. Oh yeah, Eli Roth. I think he could make a very interesting yeah, film out of give Halloween. Yeah, a little twist. Yeah. So that's just some ideas. I, I just worked out a few ideas there. Sorry if you keep hearing that banging noise. I just keep dropping my phone down on the table like an idiot, like a complete unprofessional. What else is new? But that, I don't know. Just something I'm throwing out there. If you guys have ideas for who might make a really really cool Halloween film going forward, if there's someone I haven't thought of, throw it in the comment section. Joe and I literally read and try to respond to every single comment. We love hearing from you guys. So if you can think of another director, or if you disagree with any of my thoughts and any of my directorial choices, go for it. Let me know. And, and, and Joe, why don't you say what you were saying to me before about the comment section for this movie? Well, I just want to say, like, like I am all for a lively debate, but I just want everyone to keep it respectful. Uh, we'll pull any comments where you guys are attacking each well, other. Well, but, yeah. Say what you but, want about the movies, and, and, but let's just disagree be, with each other. Let's That's just fine, be nice to each other. Just be nice, you know, because we've had a great time so far with 13 episodes, no problems. Everyone's been and, so cool. Uh, and we get it. We know that this movie is not for everybody. It's divisive. But we're just here to serve sort of you know we're, we're all we're all pulling the same cart here yeah. with the halloween franchise okay we're trying to have as much fun with these as you can not we're, just we're, sit here and, and and bash them you know like i i would personally say if you want to say what you want to say about the film or the trilogy or the franchise you go ham and say whatever you want all i think we're trying to say is just just be be polite and reasonable with each other and, and because we're all fans, we all love these films, we all want the best for this franchise. There's not one person that's listening to us babble on right now, that's taking time out of their busy lives to listen to our little YouTube show. There's not one of you who isn't here because uh, out of anything other than love for this franchise. And every one of us wants the best for this franchise so just remember that when you're debating with anyone in the comment section or even on our instagram page if you're debating in that comment section just remember we, we are all the same at the end of the day we all love these movies even the ones we don't like as much we all love them all so just keep that in mind yep that's all and with that said it's yeah. just important to quickly say i say it every time and i'm going to continue to say it every mm -hmm. time joe and i are not experts we are just fans just like you guys. We do this series simply to reach out to other fans, to watch these films with other fans that, that love these films, and to, to, to connect with other fans that love these films. That's it. So if we get something wrong, or, or we miss something, or, or there's something that you know that we don't, let us know. Joe and I, we collect information about these movies. So if you've got a, a fun fact that you want to share, throw it in the comment section. If you disagree with something we said, like if you disagree with my point of view about this movie, and you agree with Joe, or vice versa, let us know. I, I, we want to hear from you. 
that's all. And, and we also just want to say, as we do every time, and we mean this sincerely, and I mean that, sincerely. This is not lip service, sincerely. If you've taken time out of your busy day and your busy life to check out any of our work, any of our creative content here on YouTube, we just want you to know how much we sincerely, legitimately, deeply, deeply appreciate you and thank you. We've, we've gone through now all the films in the Halloween franchise and we want you to know this is not the end. This is simply the season one finale. This is simply the end of, and this isn't even the end of our coverage of the Halloween films. Oh no, we're we'll, going to be making we'll many. Stuff, yeah. We're going to be making many Halloween videos to come. Believe me, but but would you, and when more movies are made, we'll do more. Yeah. Commentary. In terms of the standard fan commentary over the movies, this is it. We've gone through them all to yeah. one degree or the other. There's, the, I know, of course, there's director's cut and theatrical cuts, but and maybe down the line we go back to some of those. But, but right now, right. stick around to the end because we're going to be making a special announcement at the end of this episode where we're going to be revealing what franchise we're going to be covering for our fan commentary deep dive explorations for season two which will be starting in november of 2023 yep so going just right stick around it. we'll be talking about that at the end of this episode we'll be letting you know after much debate between ourselves we've decided <laughs> and we're both happy with the choice and we're just hoping to god that you guys are going to continue on this journey with us but we think if you love these movies you'll probably love those movies yeah too, so yeah anyway just stick around that'll be at the end but yeah thank you so much we really really love you guys it, it, it's almost impossible I mean, I could speak for an hour about it or more, but, but I just hope you guys know that we really, really, really do. We appreciate every single one of you that has subscribed, that has followed our Instagram page, that has listened to all these episodes and commented and sent us, send us beautiful and friendly and kind messages and supportive messages and comments. We, we deeply appreciate it, and I can't say it enough. Thank you. Thank you so much for helping us build this, build this channel, build our Instagram page. We, we really would be talking to thin air without you guys. So, And I think when we started, we assumed yeah. we would be talking to thin yeah, air. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, I, I, when we started, I think our goal was to have like 100 you know, subscribers we, at we the were, end of 13 episodes. Yeah. And now we're, at, we're almost at like 1,300 subscribers. So this has been a crazy adventure and, and we, we didn't anticipate. Day. It yeah. literally grows every day, which we is mind We did not anticipate this at all, but we thank you guys. And, and this is like guys. such a, a, a passionate community of people that, that check out these episodes and passionate fans of these movies and of horror in general and of just movies in general. And so we're just like that. We're, we're, we're only doing this because we love movies. We love you know narrative storytelling we love horror we love halloween and and all these cool franchises from our childhood and beyond and into the future so we're just glad that you guys are here checking it out and watching these movies with us and and this is only the beginning we're just we're just yeah. getting started with haddonfield radio believe me so well, we, we like talking about movies that's yeah. for sure so so stick around anyway yeah all. let's get to the movie because yeah. we're not borrowed time here we're in the rented studio at wurg yeah, so we, we're the not kid. in our usual space uh, we the, gotta the corpse of willie the kid will be coming in any minute to, to, <laughs> to start his shift so we got to get going all right let's do this i like i like in this movie how they start right away with the the radio stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? These films, all three of them, have all had really, really effective pre-credit sequences that start at the Universal Studios right. logo. And and I like the way that, that you, you quickly get put into the reality of the movie yeah. right from this opening moment. And I do know that in the early test screenings, they were having trouble, or they noticed audiences were having trouble tracking where the, the DJ comes from. By the time we see him, wait, wait, what do, you, what do you mean? So, so the the early screenings they didn't have as much of these things like the billboards where you see oh, him and the okay, right? yeah, yeah. So that yeah. by the time we get to where the, he comes outside and then yeah, like the audiences were having a little trouble making the connection that that was the guy that they were hearing and da 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 da. So I think there has there was a push at some point to to put a lot more of the DJ in. And of course, this is the original Halloween 3 season of The Witch font. Yep, they they clearly... That's what I mean. Right from the beginning, he is clearly telling us he is gonna go there you well, know he, with h3 right, right. The, with you know what i mean and well and, it's, it's really the closest get ready to, to be for it to be different it's it's exactly it's really the closest corollary of any of the other films in the franchise to this yeah in terms of again 
its level of expectation versus delivery right. is, 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 is a wide chasm between those two. Uh, th- th- you'd need a big bridge to, to cover that chasm. And I will say that until... Oh, this is a great joke. Corey, you're a lifesaver. Right. And, first, and, first lines, you and know. And I wanted to point something out right there really quick. Remember we were talking about subjective uh, storytelling in, yeah. the, in the Halloween yeah. films? Did you notice that the the actress was sta- in the first line she's staring directly into the camera yeah which means the character is looking directly into the eyes of Corey right which means the camera is Corey which yeah. means you're being told subliminally from the beginning of this film that you are from Corey's perspective oh sure so it's very interesting to me there's a director Jonathan Demme who made Silence of the Lambs and he uses a lot of that in his films like characters staring directly into the camera yeah it's subjective um, filmmaking and I find it very effective now, the first time I saw this movie, before you know, you, I realized where it was going to go, I, I, I thought this was an amazing opening. It's probably one of my, my, m- oh, my most God, favorite yeah. openings to a Halloween movie, you know. Um, Almost as like a little short film in and of itself. Oh, it's so great. This is really because good. Because you know what they're doing? They're playing you on so many levels of, you don't know who anybody is. They're referencing... The events and where they are. So you feel comfortable. You know we're here. You know where we're supposed well, yeah, to be. Yeah, you know we're in Haddonfield. You're where we're supposed to be, right? So, but you're like, what is going on? Um, and then, you know, you realize babysitting. Okay, you're set. It's it's feeling familiar. It's a babysitter on Halloween night. Uh, and then the kid even talks about Michael Myers. But yeah. then the mom over here starts bringing up the kid hearing voices. And you're like starting to wonder, like, oh, God, is it the little kid that... Is the focus here? Is the one? Are we getting a little kid that's becoming like Michael? Well, yeah, and, I mean, he, David and, Gordon Green is like you said. He's putting you on your back foot here with the opening. And then by the time I'm upstairs, I'm almost wondering, oh my God, is Michael hiding out in in this kid's attic, and he's the only one who knows it, and that's why he's hearing voices, this and that, and that's why he trapped this kid in here. Is Michael about to pop out? I mean, I, my brain was going on so many different places like what is happening here what's going on i was loving it and then obviously the kid the kid falling is just a brutal but brilliant death yeah you know and, and the kid is so goddamn obnoxious that right, exactly. i was sort of glad to see him fall three stories to his death and see you know, again you Corey's see Corey's looking directly kid. into the camera yeah you're going to see a lot of that in this movie and and it and here's a john carpenter's well, the thing of course so here's where we get to bring john carpenter's own movies into the universe you know what i mean with uh, and the obvious homage and there's another thing that's interesting about this opening is right away it establishes this interesting thing with masks. You, you know, you well, start Chris with the Nelson wolf Chris made mask. this too. So he you made know, that wolf mask? Yeah, exactly. So oh that's what you God. have to remember is besides the obvious Chris Nelson being in charge of the, the, the makeup effects, yeah. and the gore, like any, any mask being seen is... Because then they don't have to pay rights. If they're going to go use something that's an old Halloween mask or from a movie or from, you know, it's a whole thing. And, and you know, this guy can make his own mask. Before so. we started recording, Joe and I were just chatting, and I, I said, and, and he agreed, one of the, the biggest heroes of this trilogy and whose work I think is really, in my opinion, beyond reproach is definitely Christopher Nelson mm-hmm. and his incredibly talented team hey, really, that did all the makeup effects and, and all these types of uh, special effects. Really quick, before we go too far, did you notice, too, that it was Corey that gets grossed out by the movie and shuts it off? And Not he, the kid. He puts it on the he, kid. He yeah. does it for the... He says it's for the sake of the kid, right? But, you know... And here's Corey's weird connection to chocolate milk that kind of it. goes through this entire movie. Yeah. Well, and then, and Laurie had a strawberry milk thing. Oh. You didn't... Yeah, in the first movie, you she makes strawberry milk. And oh, then, yeah. And oh, then in yeah. 2018, he had her making strawberry milk again. Uh, yeah, and, and then he's got a chocolate milk thing. Um, but I love the obvious good kid, like... He looks at the bear. No, I, I shouldn't have that. Uh, but by the middle of the movie, he's out with Allison, and he was running up to the bar yeah. going, give me a beer, you know? So when I was first watching this movie, right at this point, I said, oh, okay, I think I know where this is going. Well, Michael Myers is in the house. Right, you know, that's what yeah, I, was, yeah. I was, that's what, that was one of my thoughts, too. Like, okay, they want you at first, you're wondering if the kid is, is a little nutty and creepy like Michael was. But then you start going, oh, wait. 
Or, I think, think Michael's up in the attic, and this kid's trapping Corey in there for Michael to get. Yeah, is, he, is it like potentially like the way they're making, were they making an allusion to the fact that the little boy is like how Michael was a little boy in Halloween 78 when he was like the six-year-old killing people? Is this little kid going to well, be a killer? I, I kept thinking it was like he f- he knows Michael's in there and hiding, and he basically stays alive because he he can... He's trapping a, a victim up there for him, you know? Right, which, it's which is like, an interesting <laughs> foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah, leave me alone and I'll do, you know. There's something else that is all through this movie, especially through this section, if you watch, where you see doubling of Corey in, in reflections. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, and the yeah. idea that there's two Corys, mm-hmm. and, which ends up being sort of a, uh, an important uh, thematic concept in this film, this this duality in Corey's psyche. Sure. Well, yeah, it's... Uh if you if if you when you watch the movie going forward, Corey's med- all his different changes are based around great falls from a height. Oh, very interesting. Okay, so f- here the child falls, changes his life. He gets thrown over the bridge. He falls, hits, finds Michael, changes his life. Um, uh, he uh, falls in love he with Allison. He falls in love, if you want to go there. Yes! At the end, he gets shot, it. shot by Laurie. He falls over the banister oh, again yeah. and dies. Damn. So, uh, or, you know, kills himself. But, uh, you know, I don't know. That's it's, a really good one. That's a good catch. I, I, I love that. That's a really good thought. I like that. And, and yeah. I, and, of course, you have him carrying a knife around. Well, right. You're, 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 a they're, kitchen knife, no less. They're, they're really setting you up to... F- to, to but, to see, f- that's effective filmmaking. It is. It's great. It is great. Uh, I love this. I was so, like... I was... Blo- like, I remember thinking uh, up through these credits at, like, going, oh, my God, this is... I think this is going to be amazing. Yeah, I, think, I, I, I agree. I think this is going to be over the top. Yeah, I, 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 I went know? from, like, laying back in bed and watching this the first night. I remember by the credits, I was sitting right straight here. up. I mean, I thought, okay, Michael is in here. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I never thought of... And... I never thought of what you suggested, the idea that imagine if the kid had been working or, or helping Michael, almost like in his own... Like a little acolyte, like right, Corey right, ends yeah. up becoming. Yeah. You know, that's kind of would have been an interesting way to go as well. But that's the thing of what's so cool about this opening is it... it it lets you your your imagination is trying to get ahead of the movie. Yeah. And I'm talking from the perspective of the first time you see it. Your well, imagination is trying to get ahead of especially it. Especially when he's presenting you with all characters you don't know. Right. Right. Because right. you're going, what is the connection? Any of them here? could be expendable. You, you're waiting for a connect a bigger connection. Michael's gotta be here, right? Because it's not Laurie. It's not any of them. It's you know it's, uh, so And the mother primes you to think it's Michael by saying, Well, the son's been not sleeping. She's he's been talking about him. He's hearing yeah, voices. We, blah, we blah, know blah. that it's only a year, but they didn't find him. Oh, this is just, this is brutal right here. Uh, that right that there, dummy. where the neck would have uh, broken. Uh, and and again, at this point, when I'm first watching the movie, I'm thinking, what in God's name is I know. this movie? I think what I, is going on? I think I even paused it right here because yeah, I watched it on, on Peacock too, and I was like, wait, 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 wait. Oh my God, this is amazing. I really because you know again. Uh, I, David Gordon Green's he's an effective filmmaker he's a, gr- a really good filmmaker so d- despite you, what you would think about the story this yeah, that was entertaining to watch and again you have another one of these really really cool uh, opening credit montages I love this this old school way of having the actor's name and the character's name right. they play now, I, I love that I I had read that they did film this practically the, the, the oh I believe that yeah. but 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 ultimately, this is CG. I don't. I don't know why. You know, if it didn't work or. or oh, or they wh- tried to, to build I, I, it. Yeah, the, I know. The I read that they did right. film it. I don't know. They didn't. What I read didn't mention why they switched, but it just said ultimately it was done with CG. It, it almost. It's funny because in a CG way, it almost sort of emulates like a stop motion look. And, yeah. And oh which yeah. You could have done that with. You oh, could have, but it just would have taken yeah, a lot longer. It's done well. Yeah, I um, like it. You and know, I like the idea of one uh, pumpkin coming out of another pumpkin. Right, exactly. You know, like the evil, you know, morphing out of another evil, which and is we, really what a lot of I, this movie is about. I can't remember. What do we do? Do they end on the original pumpkin or did it start on the original pumpkin or oh, something? Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. So it's an uncarved pumpkin. Reborn, right? Ooh, that's really interesting, too. I like that. Yeah. This one, I think, had the most screenwriters of any of David Gordon Green's three. Well, so he had a real interesting way of doing it, I thought. They, you know, him, he and Danny McBride were the main guys, right? And 
and they would sort of kind of come up with some main themes and then they right, bring in the right, other two right, guys and right. say now you guys write your versions they would all write their own versions of a scene that they kind of all agreed upon like a, a, a direction like a, something should go and then they all write their own scene they all come together and they kind of find the best of the best it, it's a you know i it sounds perfect but i i have to wonder about egos i guess it's, you got a bunch of good guys who are friendly with each other enough to, to to do that i think usually you wouldn't think that would work right but but you know i know david does like to surround himself with his his long time collaborators yeah he has and, like a, a team you know so i guess by, by now after 15 films or so you've got a little team of guys and you know it's you know what what works and and one thing know, these yeah. three movies, in my opinion, do really, really brilliantly is capturing the spirit of Haddonfield, capturing the vibe of Haddonfield. I think these three films, it's one of the, in my opinion, the strongest aspects is the way that David Gordon Green and his team, his production designers, his yeah. set decorators, and, and just his cinematographers, they, they capture the the way Haddonfield should look and feel that that Pasadena look, and, and even I'm though not, they're in like Georgia, is, I was going to ask if you yeah. knew where they filmed this. Yeah, I mean, next to the original, to me, the original does always have a thing. Oh, so really quick, if you had noticed right here, yeah, in the articles that they ended up tearing down the Myers house after the last movie. Oh, it says that in one yes. of the, Oh, very So cool. that's why we never end up back there at all. And did you also notice that one of the cops right there putting him in the car? The Haddonfield Memorial Hospital? No, uh -oh. is, the, is the guy later, uh, who Allison's, uh, oh, oh, the cop the, that she's ex, dating. Allison's ex? Yeah. Now, wait, really quick. Did we already see the woman who's hung, hung herself? No. Okay, hold on. Yeah, this, she's. Yeah. This is that kid, Oscar's mother. Exactly. And she's. W Oscar was the the nerdy character who got hung up on the fence in the yeah, first movie. And, and did you know she's wearing the same outfit? She's wearing yeah. his Halloween yeah. costume. Yeah, exactly. And, and taking, I didn't pick that up. You're taking my fun facts from oh, me. Oh, sorry, I stole Joe's fun fact. That's that Damn should have it. been that should have been Joe's fun it's fact. Thirteen episodes. I thought we had a thing <laughs> down by now. Come on. I ripped off your whole thing. All I'm right, so sorry. All right, Just okay. pretend Joe said no, that. That's all good. That was Joe's it's fun fact. It's all good. I love Andy Matichek. I, I love her. I love her presence. I love her charisma as an actress. And I love her character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, again, my my issues are only with where the story takes her, not not these actors. They, and I they like, all do a great thing. And I love part of her title mentions the the Samhain, the Sam Hain. And, and yes, thing, it's, right? yeah, the Sam Hain, yeah. Which I, I, I think in the... Look, look, I know Joe and I, as Joe just said, we both know it's pronounced Samhain. That's right, the yeah. traditional, you know, pre-Christian, pagan, or Celtic pronunciation. But if you go by the pronunciation uh, depicted in these films, it's Sam Hain. When Donald Pleasance brings it up in part two, uh, you know, it's he's not quite right with what he's talking about. But by, by part three, when Cochran is given his whole spiel, that's a little more accurate to what the idea was behind the 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 sound thing well they're bringing it in through uh like the prism of the reality of these movies they're, they're funneling the ideas of 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 those that celtic tr or pre-christian traditions through the reality of these films and, and in that way it works f through what dr loomis is how dr loomis is depicting it now it's really cool to see this this much more happy and bubbly version of laurie strode in the beginning of this film Yes, we, it's kind of like seeing old, old Laurie progress, like, like like the original Laurie be pre Michael Myers attack. What she would have been like, if, right? You know, she kind of let it all go here. But you know, and, and it also sort to, of feels a lot like Jamie Lee Curtis to me. It, it no, it is. But I and you that's know, not I'm a slight. I'm gonna take back my comment because because original pre Michael attack. Uh, Lori was valedictorian and a very put together kind of mousy. Yeah, she wouldn't be this kind of klutzy all over the place person. But you then know. again, people change through the course of the. I'm not the person but I was. But it's mainly when I was because 15. she she went into this attack mode for most of her life, waiting for him to come back and never learning these life skills and shit. That's why she's trying so hard now. But. Um, so you can already see this clean cut version of Corey that you see in the very beginning has already kind of degraded based on what has happened to him in the subsequent. 
subsequent years. And obviously, you see love, the love lives, lives today. today yeah. But, yeah. Oh, geez, they're yeah. really drilling that one, and that old chestnut. Yeah, in. yeah. Uh, he, every once in a while, I think he does wear his, uh, you know, um, homages on his sleeve too much when he tries to s- slip things in there. And of course, they're showing that. Uh, foreshadowing that that piece of equipment that crushes cars. Right, of course. They're foreshadowing well, that. Obviously, we're gonna get there. I like the casting of now. A lot of people wonder: Is this Corey's stepfather, or is it, it is. a boyfriend it's of the his, mother? It's his stepfather. Okay. And, and he's um, a very kind of endearing character in his own is, way. He is. And, and the, they they talked about how much they loved working with that guy, and that unfortunately though he was so sweaty that that pencil kept falling. So. <laughs> So there's a big hunk of gum behind his ear holding that that pencil in place. Please God, tell me that's a fun fact. That is, no, actually it wasn't. But let's let's call it <laughs> that because that might fact. be one of the funnest facts we've yeah, had. Yeah. This poor man had such sweaty ears that they had to affix gum behind it to hold yeah. the pencil in place. But they said they all loved him and the way oh, he always walks around going, "Hey, Corey!" That became a thing. Everyone on set kept began to yell all the time in the, in, oh, in the way God. he would. Yeah. I gotta uh, say, I really like and, Rowan Campbell. What about wait, you? You know his name yeah. is Rick Moose. His real name? His his, his real name is, or that's his. That's it's a hell of a hell of a. He stage uses name. for credits in movies. Hell yeah. of a stage name. Um, and that billboard is digitally added. So that was originally. This is fun fact. Uh, uh, that was originally going to be an homage to the Red Rabbit. Oh, and then wow. when they realized that they had to get the DJ in there more, they they sacrificed. Uh, Ooh, I don't know, man. I, I know uh, that kind of that riles me he, up a little. He said he he it was a better thing to have audiences understand the character in the film than to than to have that homage to to the Red Rabbit up there. Oh my God! You have, here you got the world's like, the officer who's like out of the 1970s. Well, here's another. He would, he's sexually harassing someone you pulled over. I know what you're gonna say. Go for it, because I what? got some stuff about this guy too. No, 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 no. The cop. Oh, fun fact. Yeah. I'm um, going through fun facts quick here. So that is Officer Mulaney. Right. Right. So he's related to. Don't fuck with the Mulaney's. Yep. You right. Got so it. he's supposed to be some deli- uh, distant relative of the kids we see in the flashback in Kills. Couple quick things. Okay. Yeah. Um, that homeless man that you see pop up again, his character's name is actually Nelson Christopher, huh. which is kind of interesting. Okay. The other thing is he's muttering this song, and yeah. when I, I I listened, I looked on the, the the subtitles to see what he was the the lyrics, and it's called the Oliphant in the Sea, and it's like an old Irish shanty song that is about this. Uh, uh, this character that fights this horrifying evil, this evil, like ancient worm, like which is mo- more like a dragon, mm-hmm. but that's what he's singing about, which I thought was kind of an interesting little weird little kind yeah, of addition yeah. in there. But it's cool that his name is Nelson Christopher, right? And I have this weird thought about the homeless man when I was first. Okay, th- this is obviously not true. Yeah. But yeah. what if he was the real Michael Myers? <laughs> no, no, hold on. What if that homeless man is Michael Myers? Um, in w- <laughs> continue. <laughs> I'm listening. I don't have any more than that. Uh, suddenly, Michael got very talkative. But what if that uh, was no. Michael Myers? <laughs> so supposedly, the the black convertible that this kid drives is an homage to the black convertible in H5 that Mikey has. Hold on, what? Yeah. Wait, the one that that they pull, the these boyfriend kids pull up in right oh, here. Oh, that's See pretty cool. Black- See, I wouldn't have known that. And, and the, the actor here, the, the kind of douchebag in charge here, he was supposed to drive the car, but the actor showed up on set and was like, yeah, I grew up on Staten Island and I don't know how to drive a car. I don't okay, have a license. Uh, one of my weird things about this group of kids is I don't understand. It doesn't seem like this kid would hang around with this other kid with the mullet. That's what. So David Gordon doesn't Green doesn't it seem odd to you? Said it was kind of done on purpose. He took like a group of kids that he he said don't look like they would hang out with each other, and made them you know the kind of the bullies, but then also made them the in the band, and just kind of tried to keep twisting the expectations of okay high school I, 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 yeah what you see out of high school because it is you know? a very odd group you have the, oh, yeah. the band chorus orchestra girl yeah. the other girl i don't know what her thing is the the <laughs> bad the kinda, sweatpants the kid with the drumsticks and yeah. then the jock yeah but jocks at least in my but high school career the jock. he's a band they're all in the band oh he's in a band they're all, he he's, says he goes okay, hey man we're yeah. in the marching band okay you, know? like, you almost look like a the, jock to me we had the big games tonight but they're all wearing their marching band uniforms under their coats and things there yeah 
Yeah, I guess you wouldn't necessarily it's expect weird... them to be the bullies, well, I guess. Yeah. David Gordon Green, you know, they like to joke that he's really good at casting asshole kids. Like the kids who say, you know, like, don't fuck with the Mulaney's and then these guys. And, like, he's just good at making kids that you believe are jerks. Pretty cool that Laurie Strode is actually the first person to put a knife in Corey's hand. <laughs> Isn't that kind of neat? Yeah, yeah. I love this mask. Obviously, again, probably made by Christopher yeah, Nelson. Yeah, right? and he made the Corey Scarecrow mask. The Scarecrow one is just completely iconic to me, in my opinion. Yeah. But I actually think the cat one is really underrated. And yeah. and, and I love, though, the cat, the Scarecrow, the wolf, all these cool images that, that have this kind of subliminal symbolic meanings. Now, I also read... Uh, this is another fun fact, that this doctor, Dr. Mathis, is the doctor that the couple is talking about in Halloween Kills, the ones that are in dressed up as like a nurse and a doctor. Oh, and remember, yes, yes, yes. You're talking about how the doctor is treating him inappropriately at work. Oh, my God. What? That's this doctor. That's why they're establishing him as a jerk still. <gasps> and. Oh, yeah. I didn't put that together. That's so cool. Yeah. Let's call that a fun fact. I did, yeah. It's oh, a you fun did. Fact. Yeah, yep. I'm not listening to yeah. a word you're saying, so sorry. <laughs> Hi, over here. What else Hi, is I'm new? Joe. I'm just yeah. in my own world. Big, big surprise. <laughs> big surprise. Uh, and, you know, uh, here we begin the love story, I guess, aspect of things, which... So, you know, one thing that the com I got out of the commentary that explained a little bit to me, so... You know, once Corey starts to change here and he goes for the motorcycle leather coat look, uh, David Gordon Green said he was he was basically trying to emulate that uh, uh, character from Twin Peaks, the bad boy on the motorcycle who's got the bad rep, but he's a good guy. You know, I don't know if you watch much Twin Peaks, but that right, was right. literally the 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 character they were trying to sort of emulate with Corey sort of transition into the 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 guy in town the oh. who looks like a bad boy but the town hates him and because you know Twin Peaks is associated with the, the, the murder of uh, you know, Laura, Laura Palmer, Palmer. that and, that scene also is interesting right there because remember earlier we were talking about the elements of possession that are in this movie yeah, potentially yeah well it, it occurs to me there's also this through line that goes through a lot of the conversation in this film especially between uh, Allison and Corey about infection. Yeah. And the idea right there that she's cleaning up his wound, she doesn't want it to get mm. infected. Yeah. And the idea that maybe more so than possession, the evil of Michael Myers is infectious. And, and has infected this town of Haddonfield and has infected the citizens of Haddonfield. Oh, yeah. And, and certainly infects uh, Corey. Yep. Now, I want to bring up something here really quick. We're seeing the radio tower that's established, I think, in all three of these films, right? Uh, no, I think it's just the, the second one in this one. Okay, well, hold on one second. Let me dig out my note here, because it's important to give credit to the person who commented it in our comment section oh, last yeah, episode. Yeah, good. You're bringing that up. Good, good, good. Uh, so, uh, Sondra Studios 6675 is a YouTube handle, a commenter. I wish I had his actual name, but I don't. If you're out there, we appreciate you. He, sa he left a comment in the Halloween... Uh, Halloween uh, Kills comment, comment section saying, quote, the point of the tower is the continued spread of fear due to Michael Myers, unquote. And that really got me thinking. Did you notice that comment as well? Yeah, I did, because it's, it's, it's the best sort of explanation, actually. I was hoping I would get more out of David Gorda Green, uh, giving maybe a little more explanation behind it all, but he, he really doesn't. It, and I, I don't know if that's intentional or not, or... He thinks it's more obvious to everyone else that that's what it's supposed to represent, you know? Because he's clearly, he, it, it is a focus for him. He spent a lot of m money and energy adding them in the in kills as a added effect, hoping, you know, it was payoff here. Right. And then as this movie was being tracked through test audiences and he was realizing that people weren't giving, associating everything that he wanted them to at the radio station, they again went back and did things like sacrifice the Red Rabbit, you know, billboard to make sure everyone is following this radio station, which is kind of like a little blip of, of, right, of color right. and, and, and light. And he's also the person that is still trying to say, like, things aren't right here with this Michael Myers situation. He's a little, he's not like affected or it's, it's, 
I don't know what it is, but the DJ is on a different path than everyone else. Well, you know? the DJ. He's saying, "Why aren't we? Why aren't we looking at this?" The more? DJ this guy can't is be... also continuing to spread the mythology of Michael Myers. Well, yeah, so maybe and, that's and, it. And, and, maybe and dis, that is how and it does disallowing, spread. You're right, you're right, yeah. And dis, and disallowing Haddonfield to move on. He's he's part of what's holding Haddonfield in place in their trauma yeah and and what's cool is that commenter that brought up that point reminded me of this other movie and i've talked about other horror movies that are relevant in the past well this one is this film by bruce mcdonald called pontypool p-o-n-t-y-p-o-o-l if you guys out there haven't seen this horror movie i strongly suggest you look it up it's one of my favorite horror films of the last 25 years and basically what it's about is a lethal virus that spreads through human language and it's about this shock jock dj in this wintry small canadian town who's broadcasting himself in 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 and his voice alone, going through the radio tower, is spreading this virus and turning all these people into these violent savages, almost like zombies. And it, and it's it really kind of is like a corollary to I think some of the themes and some of the uh, uh, ways that the the tower could, is used in these films mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is this this point of infection of of information and of of kind of a. Uh, Perspective again, perspective, and it's also a bit of a callback to the idea in H three of of killing the Absolutely. children through a transmission. A of, transmission. Of, you know, That's exactly right. You That's know. exactly perfectly put. And and of course here we, you know that we're foreshadowing by putting Corey in the overalls. You know, I mean, uh, right away he's just wearing Michael Myers outfit almost. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. And here you have just like a really nice scene. I, I actually am someone who really loves this this kind of gentle romance development between Officer or Hawkins and Laurie Strode. Frank and Laurie, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, and I love going back to what we talked about last episode to this concept or, or, or speculation that Hawkins was actually Karen's father. Right, biological right. father, yeah. and, and and of course, so that would kind of build this connection that he's had with Laurie Strode for for literal decades. Well, and they're also the shared victims of the same exactly. Trauma. Let's say, like, let's face it, like you want Laurie to to be able to move on or find love and all that, but she's a very heavily traumatized person. But who else could understand that besides somebody like this guy? Who's been through it all and and, done, and I think that's you know, so Michael Myers well done because the idea that you don't escape from trauma. You don't escape from uh, this type of <laughs> psychological scars well, and psychological damage. So, but if you can find solace in someone else who understands what you have been through because they've been through it, you can find some version of happiness. Plus, I, I do think it, it sort of represents two, it's almost like two sides of the same coin. He's already made the decision to move on and, and say, I, I, it's like I have a new life, and I'm learning all these things. I want to go do all this stuff. And Play I'm, guitar and go and see the cherry blossoms. She's like writing this book where she keeps questioning. She even says, like, do I pick... I forget what it is, fear, or do I pick cherry blossoms or something like that? Well, like well, she's trying to figure out how to how to go his path. Like she wants to go there. Well, but simply by she's writing still the book, a little stuck. Simply or she's by writing the book, using the book to figure it out. The book is just continuing to root her in the past. It is, yes. The the book. What she's, I she's think claiming she, sees she it. wants to share her story for other people to learn and all that. But, but I think in in its own way, what it really is is a way for her to continue to anchor herself to her own trauma, and I think that's very. Uh, intellectually interesting to me, and I think that's actually true in real cases of trauma, that that people almost become addicted to their own trauma. The and way, that sounds weird, but I think that actually happens. If you rewind there, if you look at those pumpkins, they are so fake. They, oh, you, oh, yeah. You, you can, can see, see the white the part on the... Yeah. You can also see a seam down the middle of it. Um, now, this actress has a cool story. So originally... The person in the wheelchair was going to be the sheriff with the cowboy hat. Oh, He was yes. going to be messed up over here, right? I like that. But I, they couldn't get that actor for scheduling stuff. So they decided, hey, this other woman we, can, we thought died. Can We can actually say she didn't die. And then this woman, this is like her first movie role. She literally was like a, a total 
unknown, non actor. Like, like a non actor, yeah. That kind of came in and. Well, she's and, super effective, I'll tell you that. It was like one of the first people David Gordon Green ever sort of like cast immediately after just meeting the one time. And she luckily showed up and, and did exactly what they I needed. I mean, with and, her 30 seconds, she were, literally it, levels right, Laurie Strode. Exactly. That's what they're saying. And like, levels the audience. Like, they, like, to be able to have the presence to come up to Jamie Lee Curtis and, and make her look like a, a puppy dog that just got yelled at, you know? Yeah, it's it's something. You know, Haddonfield is such an interesting setting in these films and, and such an inter- has such interesting mythology. We've talked before in, in a lot of these episodes about the mythology of the Halloween franchise, to me, is really what separates it from even the other iconic franchises of its era, like mm-hmm. like all of them. Mm-hmm. The, the thing that, to me, puts uh, to, that puts Halloween above and beyond is its incredibly you know deep mythology and something cool about halloween is in haddonfield is haddonfield is this cursed earth because the evil in haddonfield actually existed before michael myers if you think of like charlie bowles right who right, murdered right. his family they, yeah they, he does imply that it there's been an evil here um and really quick though we're about to see nick castle's his cameo uh, cameo that is not as you know the shape for once and this is his first ever on camera speaking role in a motion picture wait and a minute what yep yep the first time he's ever said words in front and of the camera see, for uh, motion picture and it's of Corey's course the head line tilt. did you notice Corey's head yep, tilt yep. And, and we all realize of course it's the line from Linda in the first movie yeah yeah uh, yep. you know uh, and you know I'm not a huge fan of those kind of forced callbacks. Yeah. Other thing is the cons- the consistent um, mentioning of tarot. Kind of puts this weird occult uh, flavor into this film. Yeah. And, and the occult um, kind of themes have gone through all a lot of the movies in the Halloween franchise. Obviously. Mm-hmm. There's also like a a a, 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 a what you call it a fortune teller. Uh, video game in the background oh, oh okay gotcha. not really a video game but you know when you put the quarters in and it's like the plastic fortune teller yeah, yeah it spits yeah. out your fortune so there's a lot of like weird little uh, uh kind of just minute occult symbols that kind of appear even the scarecrow yeah. the scarecrow itself has got a lot of that kind of symbolism and i, I think that mask that christopher nelson made for Corey is just so yeah. cool it's and, and remember once online you sent me this image of it and I wish I knew the artist of it I wish I did but somebody created this mixture of a Michael Myers mask and a scarecrow mask right right and yeah. it was so cool looking it was very cool I think yeah I've seen people really real make that in real life too yeah it's since really the drawing. neat it's really neat um, and you know Lindsay uh, the actress Kyle Richards is back in this movie she originally wasn't supposed to be but everyone was so sort of impressed with her performance and kills and she got great reviews from that that they decided to write a role to bring her back in you know i've got a really good fun fact for you (laughs) go ahead well if you look at this movie one thing that's clear is a lot of alliteration in the names right you have michael myers Corey cunningham okay Mm -hmm. another interesting one is you know that the lead bully there do you know what his character's name is? Lead bully. You know, oh, oh, like the one with like, group? that I thought was a jock. Yeah, 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 yeah. His name is actually Terry Tramer. Ah. First oh, like of all, ben Tramer. First of all, it's an alliteration with two T's. Secondly, of course. So what I did there was actually a double fun fact. Oh, look at you! Nailed it! Look at you, Terry Tramer. Uh-huh. So of course they just probably put that in there as a fun little Easter egg. But it makes me think within the reality of the film. Mm-hmm. I wonder how he's related to Ben Tramer. So he's part of that family. Since you brought up like his name being Corey Cunningham, and we had brought up the Christine references. There you go. Yes. You know he's based on the main character in that movie, which is Arnie Cunningham. Him. Whose whose character arc and trajectory is almost identical. Exactly. I mean, to this it, it really is the same. And they even like even his look in the beginning is based on Arnie's look in the beginning before he kind of gets infected by the evil, where he's still got the the, the, the parted hair and, and the, he had the same shirt on and the glasses and and then you know I don't know I saw a lot of talk about how later on with the tow truck like was supposed to emulate like the. It, like, like what Halloween Four? No, 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 no. That from Christine, the idea of using oh, yes. a, a vehicle to kill, right, was supposed to be born out of that Christine, you know, vibe they were trying to to give here. I mean, it's you know, obviously not a vehicle. I think it's on its own. It, it sort of doesn't. But I don't think that comes across. I think as they primarily. wanted. I think they wanted to basically film deaths, right? You know, using a vehicle kind of in the same way, and then is is 
is maybe what they were trying to to do. But anyway, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of similarities with the the story arc. Another interesting thing in the design of the character of Corey Cunningham that David Gordon Green and his team really were thinking about that I read is that they wanted to kind of uh, uh, put a mirror to our own modern society in the idea of like these kids that become school shooters. Oh, right, yeah. And in that... How you start to ignore the... Right, just, just this infection of thinking, of dark thinking that leads kids that, I mean, all kids are born innocent. I mean, I'm a believer in that. I believe all children are, are born innocent, and then they're colored by their experiences. Like, I'm a big, so big, my thoughts always go to nurture, not nature. That I don't think kids are born evil. Now, Michael Myers might be the outlier there. I, I might say Michael Myers might have been born evil, but I think generally in our real world, kids are born a blank slate, tabula rasa. They're born you know, open to anything, and, and how they're nurtured is, is where they go. And maybe not in 100% of cases, but I'm getting on a tangent here. <laughs> but the point of the matter is, kids can be turned into evil. They can be molded into killers. Yeah, well, when you're shunned by society, by whatever, for whatever, or you feel like you are, or, this is the effect, right? This, this kid is being looked at as a murderer, without really murdering anybody. And here's you know? this interesting uh, uh, billboard of a missing woman. Mm-hmm. And apparently one of the skeletons that we see in the uh, sewer where Michael Myers is hiding is apparently this woman. Yeah, so this interesting. There is a whole deleted scene on the, on the, on the Blu-ray that shows Co- Corey waking up down here in the cave, what's about to happen. And it's a different, whole different series of events where he wakes up and then initially Michael does, it's kind of creepy. Michael's just sort of sitting in a corner waiting for him to wake up. And then he wakes up and he attacks him. And then through the attack, Corey falls into this pit, which is clearly where Michael has been throwing his victims for the last four years. And it's just all these skeletons, uh, tons See, of bodies. Like you that's know? creepy. Like yeah. that's... Man, that's so, cool. And it's weird because you don't kind of get a total vibe besides what the bum says uh, or you know, the homeless yeah, guy yeah. about about people going but don't come out. Like, you don't totally understand if Michael has been actually killing, but he he has. I mean, but well, look, I will say going, this. Yeah. Wait, the, the, all the skeletons are pretty much totally decomposed. I mean, they're skeletons, which means those They are almost ones, look like part of the wall. But they've been places. down there so long. Yeah, yeah. That means there's no fresh ones. I don't think he... I think he killed a lot at first, but as he's become weakened... To kind of satiate his evil. He can't yeah. get out. He's just, you know, all, I think I think all the wounds are catching up with him. You know, that idea that he didn't he's feel pain his and all that. Yeah, I mean, and he's un- he had untreated wounds, which he is affected by these things. that He knew enough to wrap up his hand when it, his fingers got shot off. Um, just because he can keep moving while shot or stabbed doesn't mean that they won't get to him later. And I kept thinking about that and the idea of like you know what is it that's behind michael myers you know and i kept thinking like evil got into him because here was a kid i think that was underdeveloped it was easy for evil to go in there and take control and and he's so animalistic in 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 he in his innate nature he's almost not human in that way he never got to fully become a human and as a boy you know evil went right in there and you know it, right it, right it can't go into everybody michael was very susceptible for whatever reason like if if that didn't happen i don't think he would have just grown up to be a normal person there's something animalistic or basic or very primal about about michael and the way he was developing and it got in there and it seems to have gotten in Corey, but it didn't manifest the same way Corey has too much passion behind the, what he wants to kill he's too old right there's too much psychology there yeah all his kills are messy all his kills are based on revenge and getting back at somebody nothing is done random with him michael there's a couple of things you know, really quick too and i i totally i totally agree with what you're saying but a couple things number one all through storytelling Caves are such an important metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Now, first off, he's dragged into the cave outside of his own volition, okay? So he's dragged into here. 
When he eventually leaves the cave by his own volition, he's a changed person. Now, if you go back like a perfect example of the use of caves in fiction, you think about The Empire Strikes Back. Sure. Luke goes into the cave... He fights an image of what he thinks is Darth Vader. He beheads what he thinks is Darth Vader. The mask erodes away, and it's actually his own face. Mm -hmm. So what he was at battle with was something within himself. Which is kind of about to happen here. Which is almost identical to what happens here. But then the big change is actually when he gets outside and kills the homeless guy. That's, I think, where... But but there's something in the depiction of the filmmaking here. Would he have killed the guy if this didn't happen? Whatever... Is this a transference is this a what is, I believe this what is do a you tra- think this, this is? is a transference Michael could killed Corey here but there's a whole filmmaking thing they do where Michael right, goes into eye, the eye yeah. so is it transference or is it Michael recognizing the evil already in Corey and saying I think, oh, I'm yes. gonna let go because this guy's like me Michael rec- recognizes instinctually See, this filmmaking is to establish a transference of an energy. Now, I'm not su- suggesting this is a, a, a paranormal event. I'm suggesting this a is a shot, psychological event. That is oh, a great yeah. shot. And it's one of the best in the movie. In that the, the circle is slightly turning. It's all turning, yeah. And, re- and, and it's also it's turning. reality a, is flipping upside down And it's down turning right in now. a clockwise yeah. manner as time is moving. Now, you see... It's something's changed within him. Also, the the 180 degree rule of when he gets dragged in, the cave is on one side right, of the right, image. Yeah, when he yeah. comes out, it's on the other. Yeah. So the world has flipped. Yeah. And so I think do you those think are he would important. Have still made the decisions he's making coming up if he, even if he had been dragged in there by Michael, but didn't have that moment of the the quote unquote transference. Would Corey still go down this path? Would he kill this guy? Would he? No, 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 no. That that is one. There was a psychological transference that occurred there. Now, if you want to read it, like I said a minute ago, if you want to read it supernaturally, that's one thing. But I don't think it is. But I do think something deeply, like you said, primal earlier. Yeah. Something deeply primal had just occurred. A deep primal transference of energy between one person to another that had this. It's an infection. Michael just infected him. I say it doesn't leave Michael, but it also goes into this guy. Look, right behind him, right here, is a an erect penis. Suck my t- See it? Yeah. The symbol of the impregnation is right there. No, I'm dead serious. I'm deadly serious. That symbol of a penis, that symbol of a phallus, is a symbol of impregnation. It's impregnation of evil that he's literally been spiritually raped by Michael Myers. Yeah. His okay. soul okay. has been infected and impregnated by evil. And the and, and the evil is and I mean that word semantically exactly as I mean it because he has to gestate for a while. Yeah. Until he eventually goes back in the cave to literally take Michael's face from him for himself. It, it's an impregnation. I'm telling you. Uh, that's really my belief, and, and this I know is a that great series of you know going from checking himself to to ex- to just and again it's him looking, looking at his back, own reflection yeah and trying to yeah exactly realizing that something changed in himself yeah it, 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 the cave the deep the depth of that symbolism of the cave is not an accident David it's Gordon like Green when, understands storytelling it's like when Peter Parker wakes up after the bite and starts going figuring out. His body, his new body. Yeah, which is like a a, a, a a metaphor for puberty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he even has white fluid squirting out of his body. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Which is really a yeah. metaphor for puberty. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. But I, I know it sounds a little funny what I was saying a minute ago about impregnation in the image. Of course, it's just graffiti of, of a dick on the, yeah, on yeah, the wall. Yeah, yeah, No, but, but it could I be believe interpreted it's subliminal. That way. I see, yeah. I think it's sub- anything could have been on that set. Yeah. They decorated that set a specific way. And I believe it's subliminal imagery. Mm hmm. Because he's not going out the next minute and murdering people. It's like it has to gestate, like, inside of him. So that was the choice she's giving herself. Suicide or cherry blossoms. Right. So she's literally... Which was going to be the original ending. And then they just kept saying when they got to that point... Oh, of her realized, killing herself? Yeah, that right. they realized that they had the film Laurie doing... Like, it didn't feel right. And and that's when they changed it to a... a and they did one of those things. David Gordon Green tells a great story how he's literally at the water park with his kids. And he has the idea for the boom. The fake... The fake out with the suicide 
and he calls the four writers and he's like off to the side while people are loving life and going on all these rides and they're talking about this fake suicide to kill this murderer, you know? And then he just leaves it up to them to kind of write their versions and then they all came together with this new ending, you know? Can I jump out on a tangent here and give yeah. you my own little bizarre fun fact? Sure. You know the first time in my life, literally as a human being, I ever saw boobs was Jamie Lee Curtis in or the movie Trading, Trading Places. Places. Yeah. I believe, and I've really thought about this in the history of my life, was that I think that literally was the first time I ever saw boobs. Yeah, it's got wanted a, to say probably that. one of the earlier sets I ever saw. Sure. So she made she made a de- an indelible uh, impression on me. I love that movie, Trading Places. I think it's one of Eddie Murphy's greatest films. It was very funny. I remember. I haven't seen. And it in she's a very really long great time, in it. Yeah, yeah. And and taking for her from this horror background and sticking her with two of the most iconic comedians of that age and probably any age. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And she really showed. I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis. I, I, you can't understate how versatile she is as an actress. And you know, you watch all the uh, little making ofs uh, for this movie, where she's basically, you know, realizing and talking about how it's all coming to an end, and this is it. And she is so emotional, and and you see her on set breaking down every time, like it's a last right. day for something. And and like it really got even to me. I'm watching it, going, Jesus, like she is feeling this, like. It has got to be a really weird journey Look, to, to get to this point. You, you notice know? On, on Corey's neck, you see these markings where Michael's hand was. Right, yeah. But you know what else they sort of look like? They look sort of like hickeys. Yeah. And hickeys yeah. is, again, a sexual symbolism. If it's depicted on a character, I'm telling you. Something very strange and primal occurred between Michael and Corey there that's deeper than just, I met a serial mass murderer in a sewer. And these notes that she's playing right here are from the theme in the original movie. Oh, wow. It and also sort not, of reminded, not me, the of, regular reminded theme song, me of Ghostbusters a little bit. It does bit. When, yeah, when he walks by. Um, you know, uh, a lot of things I've read about this movie in, in, in cr- critical... Um, analysis of it people say now why why would allison even be attracted to this guy and i think to myself are those people nuts like it's she is genetically attracted to him because the trauma is part of her genes in her family tree at this point she has inherited this she doesn't have to try to pretend to be normal with him because she's clearly not feeling normal just like with with laurie strode and, and hawkins yeah there is a shared connection through trauma it's just it's just odd that I don't know that they just like that that's the biggest part of the story that they chose to spend time on. But I, I think that's the on, ultimate but. expression of the but, theme of all 13 films. No, I I mean yes, I understand how you can look at it all the way. It's just so I mean people are, don't need abstract at the end. We we are, we want a, okay. a, a, a battle with Michael and but Lori. Th- that or, would have been. Would that have or, been satisfying to you? Let's say that uh, this was the true end of the franchise, and there was never going to be another film. And say nobody ever makes another film. I, I will say this. Wait, wait. I, I do think that over time it will sit better. I mean, I can already tell you on the since it came out to now, where I you texted you saying I hated it. That I <laughs> that that I I can I can watch it within the the franchise as a whole, and and it's it, you know I like you know. I, I'll put it on every once in a while, you know, just to, just to put it on. But um, so I am I am hoping with time you sort of like it, it. Just sort of you you accept it as it is. You know what I mean? It's not what you're expecting, but I I, I, I sort of H three. I mean, there was for a long time the same thing. I was like, yeah, I don't get it. Then all of a sudden there was a a point where the, like, something clicked, and I just totally enjoy it a lot. And Probably the same sort of thing is going to happen with this. Yeah. I, I, and, yeah. And believe me, there are a imagine, lot but... of fans out there who adore this movie. There's a lot of fans that are that are serious supporters of this film. I know we mention a lot of the detractions and a lot of the detractors, but there are m- millions of major fans of this movie. And when I've been posting all month on the Instagram page about Halloween ends, I- I'm telling you, it's almost exactly 50-50 no, yeah, people yeah. who just adore and love well, this movie. I mean, movie. look at you and I. I mean, yeah, it's 50-50. Right. In a way, it's, it's but a yet we both can of, respect the filmmaking. That's what I mean. It's still, to me, an entertaining film. I'll put it on. And, you know, yeah, I'm kind of waiting for the Michael Myers stuff. But 
the more I watch it, uh, the more this kid impresses me. Cool. Uh, oh, Rowan, Rowan Campbell? Campbell? Oh, I totally agree. And the more I just start to just enjoy watching him act, regardless of my disagreements with the story. And I know in my intro I said he was a quote-unquote unknown actor, and I only really mean that in terms of, like, in terms of the mainstream. Of course, I found out after he played one of the Hardy Boys in the Hardy Boy TV series. He's Canadian. And, and, and in Canadian movies and TV, yeah, maybe he had a bigger maybe, career. Right. But he's but, young. So but I, I mean, think this you know. is what most people would know him from now. Um, and in this diner scene, I should point out somewhere, I think this is the first diner scene, first time we're in here. I know this is a weird fun fact, but go with me on this one. I love those ones. The, ba- the band Shinedown. Okay. Their guitarist is named Zach Myers. He has a cameo in this diner scene somewhere, and he's also been had cameos in many, many, uh, a few of the other older uh, Halloween movies, uh, because his real name is Michael Zachary Myers. And, and so he must have said, I can't be going around. In, in no, but he happens to also be a fan, so oh, he's a wow. huge uh, fan, he's a collector of the masks, and he actually brings on stage sometimes on his concerts some of the masks and stuff that he's collected uh so he's just got michael's name and happens to be a huge it's weird from the waist fan. up they're both sort of mirroring their their look of each other's shirts they both have that michael myers colored shirt as he's walking away i can see it's not but in that earlier shot they lo- it looked like that that sort of navy blue you know, dark right, navy right, blue right. that michael myers always wears and well his, they're his keeping one- at least onesies. glory in it a, a lot you know and of course, the bandaged hand, which is exactly right. mirroring Michael Myers from the original—not original, but the yeah, two mean, original films of this trilogy. It's so all this stuff is right out of like a lot of '80s movies. Oh, this even the music you know choice—it I mean? feels so much like an '80s film. And and uh, it's. It's almost so many that it's not mirroring just one. It's just well, well, you, you know, understand what he's doing there. You know, I think in a lot of ways too. Maybe the sentimentality that's so overt in this movie, I think, might have also put off audiences that aren't as used to that as they once were. Mm-hmm. Like, like the think of like the John Hughes movies of the '80s, where mm-hmm. where the type of like romantic oh, yeah. sentimentality was yeah. very overt, and, and 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 it was meant to provoke those types of feelings in in an audience but now that type of uh sentimentality isn't depicted the same it's, right, it's right. there's a more cynicism in nowadays yeah and as dark as this film is the love story between those two characters is very bright yeah well just the way like stranger things is playing on like the 80s steven spielberg era and feel of things this guy is going for the 80s 90s david lynchy more you know and mixed with horror all the you know all the stephen king and all it's that. interesting you know, i wouldn't have originally thought of like the david lynchian aspects of this but as you say it i yeah, do see oh, it he talks about it a lot he literally says something like anytime i got to scratch that twin peaks itch to do something in this that was straight out of it, he did it. That's well, David Lynch, you know, I was mentioning in those director's choices in the beginning of the episode. Oh, God, David Lynch, while, of course, I can't see him making it, he's weird enough, yeah, maybe he yeah. would. But he's also a master of the small town yeah. and the underlying bubbling, you know, evil or, or creepiness of small town or suburban life. And a lot of that thematically defines Haddonfield. Right. You know, Haddonfield on the outset to somebody passing through within the reality of these movies would appear to be a traditional American suburb. Mm -hmm. But if you live in Haddonfield and you know the mythology within the reality of the films and you know the mythology as a resident of Haddonfield, you wouldn't, you couldn't help but be infected by that. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was doing my research, I will say, and and I feel you know weird about it but when i was reading about all the influences that david gordon green was talking about for making this movie a lot of them i didn't know unless they were sort of uh your sort of 80s horror movies unless it was his like yeah i've I've got a few of them right here and there was a couple that i was like wow i don't know i I, they missed you know when i was a younger and he talks about because they were all the movies that his parents told him he couldn't see and he would have to go sneak over to a friend's house and watch you know here's a few of them that David Gordon Green mentioned it, that he was influenced by, and I have to admit, I haven't really seen any of these. Right, that's where I... I well, I saw one of them. I don't know if There that's... was Willard from 1971, right, right. A Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker from 1981, a movie called My Bodyguard from 1980, 
Blood Rage and Bad Taste from 1987 and Fallen Angels from 1995. Yes. I, know, I don't even know those movies. No, and I'm I, shamefully. My Bodyguard, I know, was brought up a lot by him in terms of some of the... That one the, I do the, remember. The Corey, th- yeah, the I do remember that one. And, and stuff, but... I do love this scene. So, again, right? Here we go. He was even influenced by uh, Chinese filmmaker Wong Kar Wai, which is very interesting. This is great. I love... I mean, well, here we go. We're getting Michael. I know it's coming. I love seeing the, the idea that he's been living down here and what... I mean, and there he is, you know. See but, Michael's face in the wall? Yeah, and they said they, there's a few of them that the set designer... That kinda... literally Michael's carving into the wall so he can see his own reflection. Right. Like he did in the mirror in right. Judith's room. Right. I thought that was so... See, that's beautiful see, set is design. It, is it that? Or It's weird. I never thought of it as carving. I kept thinking of as... I know this is probably even weirder. That that's why that side of his mask was all moldy... And even more messed up that he just was like leaning so long against the rock. Well, I personally that think like that the mask is meant to look like part of the wall. You were like right, he's yeah. become part of his surroundings. Right. But I think that he's been carving himself into the wall so that he can see his true now, face. Because now there's, there's a, another one right to the yeah. right of him right now. Or oh, they left. said they did a few. There's, yeah, right there's another there. one behind yep, him. Yep. yep. So... Is it a weird choice, do you think, that, that Michael went into hiding here and that the, they were never able to find him right in the sewers of their No, hometown? he was hiding in plain sight. I don't yeah, think it's weird at all. Does, yeah. oh, or this. that he would even do this for so long. This is certainly one of the most uh, controversial character decisions for Michael Myers that we're about to see depicted here. That a lot of people made fun of it, even became a meme. What we're about to see. The, 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 the energized. The, the being, see him shaking, being yeah. energized by the yeah. violence. Well, that actually has become a meme, like a comical sure. meme. Yeah. Now, I personally think it's a I very cool addition I, yeah, to the I, mythology. I never thought of it as funny. I, I get what's going on here. But you would think, though, if it's also that easy for Michael to get re-energized by killing, then he would just be killing, right? I, I love that even but, Corey's sort of shocked by what he's seeing. Yeah. He's I mean, sort of shocked. And now Michael stands up straight. Yeah, exactly. Look at, my, look at James Jude Court. We cannot go through this episode without mentioning the fucking brilliant James Jude Courtney. I mean, look at his depiction of yeah. Michael Myers, his his portrayal, his personification. There are very few, and there's so many legendary stunt people and actors that have played Michael Myers, but James Jude Courtney, for me, is so high up on that list. He just embodies Michael Myers to me. Yeah. Him and, and Nick Castle, they're the top two in my head. You know, and you I love like Dick, Dick Warlock, Warlock too. Yeah. Even George Wilbur. Oh, yeah, of course. George Wilbur, a little big and bulky, but I still love him. Now, who doesn't love George Wilbur? Uh, I'm sure he smells great coming out of the sewers and having a guy murdered on him. Uh, yeah. And then he's, like, making out with her. And... It's not exactly a, an aphrodisiac scent, I wouldn't imagine. But then again, it's working on her. Yeah. It's wow. definitely working on her, so. But so, you know what I mean? Like, if you start tracking Corey's kills, or you know, they're all people that he, ha- you know, has disrespected him or that he has a beef with. And... You know, well, it's interesting you just said that because I would count that officer's murder as one of Corey's kills. That's Cor- what I'm saying. Corey it is. used yeah. Michael Myers as that's a murder I mean. weapon. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. If you start with like that and start, yeah, like, that really was tracking his. It, that's resp- his responsibility. You know, I, I mean, I guess the homeless guy was a little. That was almost an accident, I think. Well, it was. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things you see it in movies you know, all you the could time. Say he's defending himself. You know, in I mean, movies you, you see this to, trope yeah. where the character is holding a knife and, and, and he's you're you know either defending himself or threatening somebody, and the person gets bumped into them, and the knife ends up. Oh my God, I've stabbed him. What do you think happened there? Do you think Michael fought, like Corey leads Michael has to have lead led Michael to her house? She's in a different place. He would. Well, I think, think about how Michael quickly is Michael now finds her. Michael is like an attachment to Corey now. Right. Michael and Corey have this strange link oh, now. Oh, he knows whatever co- kind of Corey knows. Yeah, I, I think it all goes back again to that moment we were talking about earlier where their eyes meet in the cave. Yeah. And, and it could have just been depicted that way, but all that imagery that goes by, I think is meant to elucidate this psychological connection that is that is enduring between these two characters of Michael Myers and Corey Cunningham. And and it's not like they're sharing a, a, a mentality, but I do think there is some strange, you know, 
strange element somehow above human psychology that's existing between them. Mm-hmm. But I think it's 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 depicted uh, subtly. Right, right. I do like this nurse. Is it Nurse Deb there? Who's she's just like the eighties, you know. Uh, See, she just says, I saw Michael's eyes in Corey's eyes. Oh, yeah. Oh, is that so, so obviously they're, they're one of her... trying to really make sure the audience understands that connection. There's someone I want you to meet. This is so weird. This, this is a little strange. I found this a little bit to be a little strained. Like this whole scene and, and, and just this. But you see the dice in the background. Dice are symbolism for chance. You know, for the idea of things can go either way yeah so it, it, there's a lot of interesting little symbols in this i just wanted to bring up actually yeah do you know um oh christ now i'm going to blank on the name of the youtube channel hold on Vi uh vamp for a minute here <laughs> hold on uh, uh i have nothing at this moment you've really right. put me on the spot Come red, on. red Come letter on. media yeah. And, and, and Red Letter Media is a very well-known YouTube channel. They do these kind of comical uh, movie analysis. And the most prominent thing they've done was this guy, character named Mr. Plinkett. And he's kind of reviewed all the Star Wars prequels yeah, and Star yeah. Wars films. And he's like, a character is a serial killer okay. who loves movies. Okay. Well, they did a video in the Mr. Plinkett identity about Halloween Ends that's really supportive of all the symbolism in Halloween Ends. And I just wanted to take a moment... Look it up on YouTube. Look up Mr. Plinkett and look up ha in his review of Halloween Ends because it's really brilliant, like all of his reviews are. Anyway, go ahead. No, no, no. This guy's got a great monologue, you know. Um, it's, again, trying to drive home that Corey has wasn't the same kid that, that he's used no to come longer, babysit yeah, right, for right. him and all that well, stuff. Well, hey, trauma you know? changes people. That That's ultimately one of the main themes of this trilogy, if not the whole franchise. And we've talked about this in numerous episodes of Haddonfield Radio. Trauma changes people, period. You, you don't go through horrifying trauma. You may be able to continue to live and even thrive, but you're never going to be the same as you were before the trauma. The trauma is like a crucible. You know, it... It crushes some people down to a powder, and it changes some people into something else, but you're never the same. But they, I love how this actor really allows himself to be depicted as a douchebag. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. This, this nurse and this guy and their whole thing, it's so, like, right out of the 80s Halloween movies, you know what I mean? The right, sort of right. bimbo lady and, and uh, sort of the over-the-top sexualized the, the body situation. The doctor who's way out of... Yeah, exactly. Now, one thing that always... Um, I jumps out to me. I don't know why in this scene I, I I can't like almost get by it is when they show the their the first time they show the glass doors that ultimately you know Corey and Michael show up to here, you see these big huge scratches along them, and I keep oh, thinking wow. that it's got to be the effect of multiple takes. See behind her. Oh my God, you're right. Like it's so obvious and a weird thing that I'm that like things did, did were that... filmed out of order. Well, like this is just take two or three, but oh they already my God. scratched it on another one somehow, and, and they didn't because well, he it comes up. and bangs on it and everything. I'm like, is that what that's from? Or I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Maybe they were always there. No, you're absolutely However, right. However, I, I my you're eyes right. cannot stop staring at I, them I when it comes it. on the screen. No, yeah. you're 100 percent correct. You're 100 percent uh, correct. You know, and then you're like, oh, this guy is really trying to make sure everything's perfect. Maybe he's he's uh, in, actually in love with this girl, even though... He, I think uh, he just wants to bang I know, her. I know. They, they were talking about it in the commentaries where they, they were disagreeing between the, uh, the actors and the director that uh, whether this was just like a, a purely sex thing or whether they were in love with each other. I mean, she's clearly not. She's clearly in it for the status right, and the upgrade right, to her life. Now, he, is, may, he may be, because yeah. that's how men normally are. <laughs> so he very well may be going down the road that she did he thinks it for she the uh, job promotion. Yeah, yeah. And, and just because the lifestyle. And so clearly Corey is, is coming here because this is the doctor that dissed Allison for the promotion and gave it to her. So that's his motivation for killing this guy. And there's also some great, yeah. Oh. Right here. Look at this. Deleted scenes where you see a little more, I think, of that, of the killing, and it's it's brutal. It's great. Well, what's really shocking about it is, unlike a lot of the other Halloween films, we haven't seen a lot of d 
depictions of of real um, hardcore violence yet in this yeah. film. Yeah. So yeah. seeing this this see that's him touching the window and you're yeah. absolutely right about yeah. the window. You, I wouldn't have noticed it, but now that you point it out, I think you're a hundred percent correct about that. But anyway, yeah, you're seeing a, the first real depiction of other than Officer Mulaney, which really was kind of bloodless. Right. This well, is like no, a, a good, gory murder. Pretty good throat slit. Look at those slices that's on the window. Great, right there. Yeah. Oof. This is a uh, you know a, a much more amplified version of the Bob death. And what an interesting! This is a true team up with Corey and Michael. They're teaming up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's leading Michael to victims. It's so pretty awesome, actually. Michael can build his strength, I assume, and he can learn. Well, he's the apprentice. He's the acolyte. So was that Michael almost like looking to make sure like Corey's watching? He's watching, yeah. of course, a hundred percent. He's. I mean, Corey literally openly asked him to teach me, show me. And that this is what Michael's doing. So think about that. He held that girl up by her neck with just three fingers. Yeah. Well, I think if one thing we've learned about Michael over the last 12 movies is he... One supernatural or argument you can make for Michael is his p supernatural strength. Yeah. But it came and back pretty that. quick. That's one of my favorite shots in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely one of my favorite shots. And then he goes and um, well, these motorcycle messes around with Allison again, and these motorcycle every time rides. He, kills, he goes and has sex with her. Yep. It's implied in a way, you know what I mean. And these motorcycle rides and when are all about transition and characters transitioning from place to place and transitioning from mode to mode within their own psyche. And you're absolutely 100 percent right. The sex that comes after violence. Well, sex and violence are like cousins right, in storytelling. Right. right. Exactly. Sex and violence are just indistinguishable from each other in terms of narrative storytelling. This is also one of my favorite scenes in the movie and one of the most horrific kills. Oh my god. A very gnarly kill. And again, I think there's even more of it in the deleted scenes. It's that it's even more gruesome. And I like the setting. I like the light from the I like the again the depiction of the the tower that is spreading this knowledge and spreading this this uh, these ideology about the mythology of Haddonfield within the reality of the movies, spreading it and infecting people's minds and keeping them connected to this horror. Yeah. Like I think it's such a great symbol that's used in these last two films. The the the, the radio tower is like a perfect symbol. It's a perfect symbol in my opinion. And isn't it implied that it was in Michael's field of view out his window and in Corey's ear 100%. talking about also... I've seen that proven. Seeing it, yeah. I don't know if I saw it on Reddit or I saw it on YouTube, but somebody actually proved based on the geography of these films that if Michael was looking out of Laurie's, uh, Judith's window, he would have seen that radio tower. Mm -hmm. And again, here's Corey's flirting with falls and height. And oh, geez, I never would have picked all that up, but that's a really great, good catch. Oh, my God. That's a good... You're absolutely right. Every time he gets a little more fearless, you know what I mean? Well, think about how Michael is. Michael, you, you can't kill him. You He's sort of impervious to harm. Well, Co Corey's probably starting to think the, the sit-up sit 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 up up. is yeah. so Michael. Yeah. It's so Michael. I love it. But it, it's like he's almost training his body to get beat up. Like he's, he's, you know, to get... To well, he's feeling less and less pain. Exactly. Exactly. He becomes more... As his spiritual nature is being degraded and consumed and corrupted, his physical nature is also going through a transition towards... As you, as you don't... As you become less and less able of feeling empathy for others, you feel less and less capable of feeling pain within yourself yeah and i think that's something that's very prevalent in the depiction of michael myers and certainly mirroring in the depiction of Corey. look at the look on his face you know it's a weird thing i always think when i look at rowan campbell i always think he sort of looks like jim morrison to me his oh, face yeah, I can do you kind of see it i do it's the the mouth and the square jaw he kind of has look. like a jim morrison look yeah, his jawline and the hair the, and, he, and he's got that style hair yeah. if he grew it into the jim morrison style we talk I about that because we're like big that. doors fans by yeah, the way but yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's coming always out great of to throw little personal facts sure he, joe uh performed in a doors tribute band for many many years and joe mm. is literally literally an expert on on the history of the band The Doors, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, well, I don't know about expert. I will say no, I, I huge will say, fan. Huge I will fan. say he's an expert. Huge While fan. I would say Joe and I are not experts and we're just fans <laughs> of these movies, I would say Joe is an expert on the history of The Doors. That's a nice little personal detail. Yeah, Why not? Well, thank you. Thank you. And this lady is just... Maybe a little uh, over the top. Yeah, but... Uh, I don't know. I don't know either the weird kiss on the lips. Well, yeah, they're going for something here. They're going yeah. for something very creepy but She's obsessed them. with her son. I mean, she's yeah. she's a, a mother that is very controlling and obsessed with her son, especially after what happened with him in the town. I love how often, you know, Uncle Ron is just... He always pops up behind the mom as she walks away, and he just has these little one-liners, like, don't tell her about the motorcycle. Do you think it's strange that nobody ever would have bought this house again? Do you notice he's sleeping on, on the, the spot stain? where yeah. the kid died? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think a lot of what's about to happen in this sequence can be debated whether this happened or this didn't happen. Well, the, like, the, I don't think... I Lori, don't think right? Lori I was going to bring here. it up. Yeah. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. The way she disappears then, I don't... She throws the airplane like the little you kid know why, threw it him. You know why I'll say... I do think that that is a common thing some people think, and I, I think it's totally right to be in, within the realm to think that. But I don't think it was intended that way because even during the commentary... I think one of the actors, I think it might have even... See how she's depicted as a Rowan. spectral figure? Rowan brings up how she kind of disappears at the end. Yeah. And that this whole thing could have been in Corey's head. But David Gordon Green just kind of has like, huh, interesting type of reaction. No. I'm telling you. Well, yeah, I, I hear you, but <laughs> I'm telling you to my mind 100%. Yeah. I'm 100% confident that they're also never facing each other. Well, no, now, uh, I guess well. they sort of are. But you notice how, like, there's all this distance between them. For a lot of the conversation, he's facing off in a different direction. Now they're facing each other. Yeah. i got to eat my words there. Sorry. Yeah. Also, but, the sheets I mean, that are I know imagery. what you mean. It definitely plays as something that could go one way or the other, especially with the way she leaves. It, to me, it's the paper airplane. To me, this, That's a symbol of the, his guilt towards that child. You know what? She's acting more like Lori from Kills here than sort of the way she is for the rest of this movie it's like weird strong i'm gonna beat everybody up laurie or like uh, uh, that little line there you 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 started this you invited me in it is something like also in like vampirism the idea that a vampire can't hurt you unless you invite them into your house you know what i mean right. you have to invite them in you in 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 her handing him the knife earlier in the movie in oh, a way he was invited yeah. Yeah. yeah he she she let me just say this Lori strode is equally to blame in Corey's infection to evil as michael myers sure is. sure when those kids were messing with him, if she hadn't, if she had just left them alone, she provoked it. Yeah, yeah, because then they wouldn't have been mad about the tire. They wouldn't have stopped pushing him over the bridge. Laurie just kind of keeps. It's it's like the lady in the parking lot too. We're, we're talking about her sister, like you know, you you provoked that man when he should have left him alone. You know. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. No, that's that's a good catch right there. You're absolutely right. He's also behind bars here, you notice? Yeah. The, depic the, the uh, depiction of him behind bars, like he's in a prison. You know, he's in a prison of his own mind now. The, no matter what, even if this is real and Lori's really here, see how now she's just gone? Yeah. But and even the chair's if she is, still tilted back. Think about that. If she's really here, right? And she really was there, whether it's in his head or not, what, he's what the filmmaking is suggesting with those bars is there's no turning back. Yeah. He's already locked into this. Yeah. Somebody couldn't get out of that chair standing up with it leaning back, so either she wasn't there or she leaned it back again. But they give you the open window as a, well, a, she's a, as all, a possible out. That's how she got out, you know, if you wanted to go that route. She's, depi she's depicted like a phantom, mostly a like how Michael's, Michael is a lot of the time. Great cut there. But you're right. She could have actually been there and had that conversation. It's not impossible I to I think it's to, really, to, you can read it that. either way, and, and it's fine. I think it works both ways, ultimately. Does it add depth to Corey when you think it's just in his head? Yeah, you know. But oh man, I don't know. I, I'm just stuck on thinking about that. Was she there? Was she not? It's it, see, I just like the dimension that this film provides. Like lots of different. It, it, look, even if you continue to hate this movie, you have to admit that the the film. No, nobody ever sets out to make a bad film, and the filmmakers allow a lot of dimension of thought for this film. It's it's not a prototypical slasher film or a one-dimensional horror film. There's a lot going on in the drama yeah. in this film. 
Now, people say, well, how the hell could he overpower Michael Myers and take his mask? Well, I would well, suggest that Michael's allowing him to. I don't I just think, I think it's a good fight. Michael's not at 100%. Yeah. He gets one good, quick moment in. You know You're what I mean? You're just an old man in a Halloween he, mask. He, he, now, he also, so uh, James Drew Courtney told him, like, listen, don't hold back. Like, yeah. And and he did that, and he, like, re they everyone could hear something in, in James' I back love this snap. Setup. Yeah. I but, mean, he knocked him out for a second. That's all, you know, he took, if he wasn't knocked out, he wouldn't have got that mask, you know? But isn't it also interesting how Michael is no longer hiding in a crack? Now he's standing a little more boldly just out in his middle and of his cave. And he's, and he's in a shaft of light, yeah, too. Yeah, he's just there. Um, Do you think he was <clears throat> eating the rats that are in the cave? Because you know he likes to eat rats. You know, well, so here's the thing. I don't. I got to wonder if the implication is with with the people that he killed is that, that he didn't eat some people. Oh, my God. I don't know. I wow, mean, well, that that's one of the creepiest things that that just hit me like a brick. Was uh, he eating his victims? Holy uh, maybe Christ! Maybe at times. I wouldn't put it past him. That's what I'm saying. I don't know. There's... Oh Jesus! That really that's a that's a mind blower. Uh, something I just noticed too the the bully kids uh, band chorus orchestra jacket the the year on the arm is 2023. Now that could be the year they graduate. Yeah. Or is this movie set in 2023? No, that's the year they graduate. Okay, yeah. there you go. I, th I always thought that was funny when she's giving it back to Laurie like that. Well, because now she's infected by Corey. Yeah, sure. She's, she's dark. Her soul is is dark is darkening too. Yeah. It's just like if you catch a a, a a communicable disease from one person, and then you go and and have you know physical connection with another person, you're just going to keep in passing that infection. But didn't they? I mean, they really kind of hit you hard with that exploration already in Kills, you know, with the town. Yeah, but that's the whole, I think that's one of the central themes of David Gordon Green, Green's trilogy, is the, the, the infective, infectious quality of trauma, the infectious, the dangerously infectious quality of trauma. Like, before Halloween 2018, Allison, as a character, didn't directly... Uh, wasn't directly impacted first person by anything that's happened with Michael Myers. She was only affected by the effects of the people close to her. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, she was raised around trauma, but she wasn't directly impacted by it in a first person level until 2018. I wonder why they chose to use Hard Target. No, because probably it's just a, a fun movie. Well, to it is throw a Universal stu uh, Pictures yeah. movie. You know, that's probably, they had to pick something they had rights to. Anne was a great old 80s. I, mean, I uh, love that movie. John Woo movie, Hard Target with Jean Claude Van Damme. It's actually a great movie. The, the lighting, the tone, the whole feel of this scene, I love. It's reminiscent of a lot of the 80s Halloween movies, but it's also reminiscent of the the uh, Stephen King 80s movies. Uh, it's also I mean, a pretty brutal scene. Oh, man, these deaths. I mean, uh, Christopher Nelson outdid himself. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, on I, I all totally of these, agree. Uh, in this whole movie, the whole trilogy, the whole, really. I mean, there's no... There's no effect that you go, that's just not... And, that you know, work. I know that there's people who will detract from everything, so there's obviously going to be critics out there of even his work, which stupefies me. Because I think the work that... And I know a few of them was like Vincent Van Dyke, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but I think it's Danielle Truniazzi. And, and if I pronounce that wrong, I really am really sorry for that. But And, and they were all part of uh, uh, Christopher Nelson's team. And they do, and it, you just see in everything they did in this movie as special effects artists and makeup artists is just nothing but pure love and passion. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you see it. And I just believe the writers, da Danny McBride, Scott Teams, David Gordon Green, Paul Brad Logan, they, they, you can just see they loved these movies and, were, and wanted to do something as beautiful and as, and as passionate as they can. And I just deeply appreciate them. I'm so appreciative of what we got in this trilogy. I think this trilogy's got a lot of depth, and I think I can't speak highly enough. And I just so I think these guys that made these movies should be very, very proud. Jason Blum included. They should be very proud. It's so good. This uh, it's so good. And you got to remember, like these are just horror movies. Like you you can't get too wrapped up. It, it sometimes an effect looks great because there's a slight 
fakeness to it or like, over brutal. the top. That you know, is pop. and that she lives through that. I know. Is brutal. Well, you should see again in the deleted scenes her him stomping on her face is so much more brutal. And than it what reminds they show. me of uh, Michael uh, Myers stepping on Dr. Sartain's head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this guy, I love it. Uncle Ron the action hero coming out with his shotgun. I I hate that he dies. I really and do. It kind of sucks that is it's Corey that gets him too, right? This is all Corey here. And well, you can but tell I mean, he gets Uncle he has, Ron too. He, has, like, oh, well, he yeah. was nice to him, but you know. Wait, does he though? Does, How does doesn't he die he, by getting shot? Oh, it like ricochets yeah, or something. I, think, right? I have to watch it again here, yeah. just because I'm not. I'm honestly blanking because, of course, I've never seen this movie. <laughs> now. Yeah, you don't want this guy. You just you don't want Uncle Ron to go. I mean, no. stepdad Ron. There, he's you. You could have depicted the stepfather in the way most movies would. There's the radio tower yeah, again. Yeah. In, in in that it's in 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 concert with this evil. Be, but he was depicted as a really nice guy and a really supportive guy to Corey, and that's what's so kind of tragic about it. It's weird he takes the mask off in front of his. Well, I think that the, the filmmakers want to he... make sure that the audience understands that this right. is not Michael. Right. Oh. That's what happens, yeah. right? They want to make sure that the audience understand. Oh, it was him. Yeah. But that it is not Michael that's doing this. Because I think they're probably were nervous that maybe the audience might think this is Michael. Yeah, and and as much as I understand him trying to take the mask and look like him, and and he's trying to emulate this this killer. To me, it's weird that sometimes well, she they, says you're dead too. Yeah. Ugh. He even kills like Michael Myers. Like he has the same body language. But that's as but that's Myers. why it doesn't make sense to me. Like why? When you, when you see oh. him, yeah, that that in the making of there's a great scene they show you doing that with the fake head. That that is so gnarly. Christopher Nelson made this awesome head that you know physically as you you yanked it back the mouth would open and close. So all they had to do is like wiggle it and it would open and close. And then they they took an actual blowtorch and just you know did it the idea of somebody putting a blowtorch t- into your mouth uh. it it literally tightens my butthole in in, in, in all the best ways uh this this his mom's death is also way extended in the deleted scenes joe and i were watching that particular deleted scene before we started recording this and it's one of those deleted scenes that i don't know it should have been in the movie because it's 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 sort of like impressionistic it gets chaotic they have trick-or-treaters at the door at the same time that are all in these weird masks. And they're singing a little bit that you might recognize from the original movie, but they just sort of imply the death there. You yeah. Know? It's, you know, it's coming up. When you see him leave the radio station as Michael Mo- with, the ma- with the mask on, um, in the window behind the DJ here, and he's doing the slow shape walk. Like, I don't know, Corey shouldn't have that walk. If you, I, I don't, it, it just... But, well, he is the shape now. I guess, I don't... Uh, he, he is the shape. Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> he is the shape. That's why he's... See, like he that, the and then it's coming up again, but... I know, but I really would make that argument. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, 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 that I get that it. infection I get has it. gestated, that, that pregnancy of evil we were talking about, or I was saying, it, it has gestated and has been born. And now it's in him. It, 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 the idea that there's Michael Myers and then there's the shape. But it's not quite right. You know, she's he's, from a, a, he's a real sociopath. And, and, and She's from the Joe Bob Briggs show. Gotcha. I forget her name, but... I think she also gets a little more of a extended death in the deleted scenes. But yeah, This is maybe my favorite death in the movie. Yeah, this, and, you know, I don't, he says that they weren't actually intending the show as much as they do here, but... It's great. I think it's great, and I I, I really like. That's it. very Myers the the head bashing until someone's just done. Look at yeah. that, and then it just it has to go even further. Uh, uh. Well, he's neutering the yeah the point tongue, of infection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, silencing the tongue. Oh, that is brutal. And the tongue, and the thing bumping off, yeah. the needle popping off the tongue. This shot right here, it's great. But you know what it is? It's one of those great shots that if you're in a crowded theater, it's I disturbing, know. but it also would provoke laughter. Oh, God, yeah. And so it's sort of a release. 
sure. it's like a build up and a release at the sure. same time sure and if anyone all of us we all know you all go to movie theaters and see horror movies when you're in that crowded theater there's nothing like it for horror horror and comedy which are like kissing cousins uh, genre wise and have the same kind of architecture and when you're in a crowded theater for a really funny movie or a crowded theater for a really scary movie it, it just is so more much more enhanced So she's supposed to be meeting him here? Is that what's going on? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Now, see, she won't even accept anything from Lori. Well, she's she, cutting herself off. This is supposed to be them leaving town. Like, that's why Corey's going on this spree right now. Right, right. Because then him and, and Allison are going to are, are gonna leave town. And, and, and is it implied that they were going to go on, like, a, a continuing murder spree I across don't know. town? I mean, I don't think she understands that that's... What he's doing, I don't think she knows that he's with okay, Michael, okay, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. She knows he killed that. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so she's trying to figure out where he is. He's too busy murdering everybody. Yeah, you're right. She doesn't really understand that yet, as, you know. He right. was going to get one last person, Laurie. Oh, it's a distraction. He's sending her away so he can go kill Laurie right now. That's why he told her 9 o'clock at the Wait, wait, house. wait. Explain that to me again. Corey is distracting her so he can come and kill Lori. Oh! You're right. I didn't pick that up. I didn't. I, ju I just got it after all these these viewings. I got to pick know? that up. I, I didn't Because it's that. weird. You would think if they made this big plan, why would Corey make her wait? You know, why not tell her when he's done? It's to, it's to keep her away so he could come to the house. So he probably doesn't want her to see what he's become for fear that she might he, yeah he's gonna yeah. he's in his eyes he kills everybody that wronged them and then she's gonna hop on the bike with him and they're gonna go leave town not ever knowing i mean i you know i guess he's just not thinking she'll ever hear about these murders or i don't know i don't know but yeah i think wow. he's trying to do this behind her back more pumpkins that don't really look like pumpkins <laughs> So again, this here is really a, a ruse, right? You were saying this idea of her going to commit suicide. Yeah, yeah. I think she understands. It's, I mean, you know, first of all, it's Halloween, right? Yeah. And she knows what Corey has been doing. She knows he has met Michael with that line. You know, like given you have to, you should give into that feeling you felt the first time you you laid eye or met eyes with him. Kind of implying he's done it. Okay. And I think at that point she realizes, oh, okay. Okay, uh, I, I gotcha. I, I, you know, it's too late for him and, and he is coming for me. He, you know. See, but in the depiction here in the characterization, I mean, she's, she, if, she, if this was a ruse, she's really acting it out. But who is she acting it out for? Do you see what I'm saying? I, I yeah, I is do. Is she assuming? I, do. I, I don't know if she's assuming or she knows. I, I, it feels like somehow she knows he's in the house right now. Huh. I mean, she's waiting, pointing the gun I'm right not the saying, I'm not saying, huh, like yeah. I don't agree with you. Yeah, you know I'm what I mean? Trying to, I'm just trying like, to play it out in my uh, head. Like, you know, I do think originally she is was written to kill herself here. Yeah. Okay, but as they kept going to shoot her, pulling the trigger on herself, they realized, uh-uh, and that's when they did the rewrite. I just want to say, I know we're breaking one of the cardinal YouTube rules by using the S word or saying K yourself, but you uh, know what, I'm not, I, I realize I'm not somebody who, who ever wants to hide from words yeah. and hide from semantics. If, if so, they get us, we'll bleep it. But if, if, if it is, if you, it's something that's triggering to you to hear those words, I, I honestly, sincerely apologize, but also, I just don't think it's... I right mean, we're just to, talking not, about facts not, of a story. And it's we're not watching. right to hide from words. Yeah. And you can't be afraid of words. So this is Corey here, right? This is Corey. Okay. Yeah. And she takes but him she out. But she thinks it's Michael. No, I okay, think she okay. knows. I, see, I'm so, I get a little confused I, I here. I do think she's expecting it to be Corey. See, at point blank range, she should have been able to just assassinate him. But then again, this is uh, like what happens or with Michael. Maybe she knows between the two of them. One of them is coming tonight, you know? Okay, gotcha. And, oh, look, surprise, surprise. But see, to me, the way she's reacting... And find mercy. This is a great scene. Regardless of whether I understand it or not, oh, this God. is a really good scene. Yeah. And it's also the beginning of the climax of the movie. And and this is, you do get the confrontation that you were promised. Oh, yeah. And this like is we great were talking about the marketing earlier. You do get that confrontation, as you're going to see. Yep. Yep. 
I, it almost makes me just want to watch this movie, like just watch this. It's hard to continue to speak about it because I, I just want to watch the sequence play out because it's so interesting. You know, he was going to go after Lori if Allison hadn't showed up right here. He and, was and still know, ready to fight. I, I but like now this he little... knows he's screwed. See, that's why you know he's doing it behind her back because once he realizes she's about to find out what he's done... He, kill, he he stabs himself and sets up Laurie as the killer. And, and the only reason he knows it's Allison is because they've established that her car has that creakiness yeah. because of the, the muffler. Yeah, yeah, that's great writing, right? Yeah. That's I like that. It's subtle, and I like it. It is. If I can't have her. This this was oh, oh unexpected. I mean that that is brutal. Oh, because he could have lived. And now she's. But but what else is a cool mirror? Now she's holding the knife, just like Corey was at the beginning when the little boy dies. Remember the, the parents come in right, and now right. Corey's oh, holding yeah. the knife. Yeah, and, and, it's and, the and same it's, thing. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. It's a mirror image of what happened at the beginning of the film. Yeah, what have you done? And again, mirror images are, are placed all through this movie. I, it's, it's amazing though that she can't verbalize uh, like he he did it. You know what I mean? Instead of just... But it's but also her, weird to think about think about how strong she was in the last movie and then in this one when when, when with an unintentional death it is it destroys her even well, though this she, guy came to kill her. But really what it is is that she knows that what what Allison is seeing here is as cr destructive to Allison's soul as what uh Lori's lived through in her life. Yeah. So that's what I think is really at play here and what really breaks Lori accidentally. So now coming up, right, we get, we're about to get into the big battle, and you were talking earlier about the advertising for this movie. Yeah, yes, yes. And, you know, you kind of thought it was... So it was weird. This kind of ties into our other show that we do, Trailer Park, and how we were we talk about trailers. And, and I know we were kind of questioning at one point, like, who makes the trailers and how are these decisions made? Well, at least for nowadays or something like this, David Gordon Green actually talked about in the in the commentary tracks how... The, the the guy who will put together this stuff literally gets to like look, the marketing person. Yeah, yeah, like like he gets to look at every single daily that is shot. Oh, even stuff that doesn't ever end up in the stuff movie. That, so, and if you watch the trailers for this movie, you see shots that are not in it from this battle. Especially, there's a famous one that they keep showing that. That's in the trailer? That mimics the original movie where she's at the edge of the doorway and he's coming up from the background, you know, behind. Um, and that's not actually in the movie. Um, so, and then, and then and, and David Gore Green actually talks about how he made a note that his next movie, so he wants to find that guy ahead of time to talk to him more about wow. you know, what goes in the trailers and stuff. You know, so there we this show. There's a little bit of that disconnect between the I, filmmaker I really, and the the advertising. But I like a guy like David Gordon Green who's going to try and go out of his way to bridge that gap a little bit. I would not have killed Corey. I would have just had Corey disappear when they they think he's dead, and then at the end he's just gone. I think what happened was, you know, I think Michael was along for the ride in the beginning when he realized it was benefiting him to teach this kid how to kill. But when Corey came or back maybe to he take was that just, mask... You, look at the radio towers on fire now. Right. He was probably... Or he could have just been using Corey to get new victims. Well, but that's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, Like, right. it was benefiting right. him to right. have that relationship. Yeah. And then also when Corey comes and, and throws him to the ground and takes his mask, well, fuck you. Now he doesn't and, need and him And now anymore. he's going to... Yeah, he doesn't need him You're dead. You're dead. That's what I do. I kill people. This episode has become R-rated. I know, God, we're dropping that's a lot. Right. Of we, we've there. we've gone twelve movies being very chaste. <laughs> oh, so this is a really cool f little fun fact. So right here, where there's the swinging cord by Laurie in there, they actually used a metronome. Oh, as like a sound. Oh, to, no, to, to, to measure to, it. To, to so it would match Michael's footsteps. Oh my God! See yeah. that's see you don't make that's right there. That fun fact is just evidence of somebody who's putting so much love and attention into the detail of a film. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that, like again, I want to just reiterate one more time. What even if you just hate this movie, you have to admit you can see in the filmmaking that this was made with care and love. Mm -hmm. If you don't like the way that the storytelling is done, that's understandable. But you know. And what a great battle. You know, Laurie, here's Laurie 
fighting without they're, they're two preparation. Two people it's in street, their sixties. It's a street battle, yeah. And and I guess you know you give gotta give Jamie Lee Curtis a lot of credit. She did like that, the face into the glass. She did a lot of these stunts herself. She wanted to do as much as possible. Let me ask you a question here. Yeah. Do you think Michael even knows who this is? Do you think Michael even knows that this is actually yeah. Laurie Strode? Remember he, he was watching her outside her, her house earlier? That's what I said. How does he know? Did he did he follow Corey to the house? Because remember in the in, in the previous movies of this trilogy, David it, Gordon right. Green sort of went out of no. his way to I, dispel that that I th- motivation I that, think that Michael and Cor- Michael and Laurie are these diametrically opposed characters with this connection. I think it's a little bit of you know, and this is, is mimicking the garbage disposal in H5 with the kid. Oh, yeah. Right? And, oh, and, my God. You're and, right. And remember how and it was Jamie needle, Lee Curtis's idea. And she wanted, she thought the kid should get his hand. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, obviously the knitting, the knitting needle. needle. Yeah, that's, but, you yeah. know, but, so that's my question earlier. So when Corey came to the house, that led Michael to see her again. So was that... The shape following Corey without Corey knowing, and also he's like, "Whoa, this is Laurie's house," and he's kind of like piecing some stuff together. Or was that Corey bringing him and showing him another victim? This is Laurie. This is where she is. Your ultimate target when you get strong enough. You know. Yeah, I gotta think about that. But yeah, I, I, you probably that's probably true. I mean, I think at this point you are supposed to feel this is personal. I mean that he is here. He knows it's her. I like I mean, that it's, she. It's, it wouldn't be as effective of a final fight if if he didn't. I like if that he she, thought he was fighting someone random. She's nailing him into wood, just yeah. like Michael's done so many times oh, in his yeah. career I of love killing. It. And his his crazy sit up just gets him out of being stabbed. But man, what a way to take this guy down. Well, he, like you said, all through this movie, we've established he's in a weakened state. He is. He is. He's not sure. at a hundred percent anymore. His nope. body I mean, has taken so much abuse. For a guy his age and everything, he's incredibly strong. Yes, but and obviously the pain thing, you know, here he is just ripping through knives. Well, with this his is hands something else. Like the trauma, in some ways, that's weakened Michael over time has strengthened Laurie over time. See the reflection. Yeah, I love that. It's supposedly a callback to the. The series of movies like four or five and six or five. Well, she's six she's playing H2O. with his reflection. Yeah, but it's in all those posters. You know what I mean? Where they have the knife and the reflection, and she's almost using it hypnotically because Michael's reflection is so engrossing to himself. You're exactly. So she and you notice he stopped squirming for a second when he was seeing yeah. himself. Yeah. But that's because he's seeing his true face, which is the mask. This to him, that's the shape. This is Michael Myers. Yeah. This is great. Oh, it's this is beautiful. The reveal, the the. I've tried to contain you. I've tried to contain you. I find that to be a very interesting line. I've tried to contain you. Well, she built that whole prison for him. Yeah. I thought maybe. And she just bleeds him out. In the in in the the makeup, Chris. Now look at the amount of detail Chris Nelson does in this makeup and his team. Yeah. And yet you you only see it very fractionally. But yet the, the little wispy beard hairs, yeah. the, the, the boils on his skin. Oh, my God, it's Ooh. so creepy. Gets her again. I mean, See, it's... I would have figured that was going to happen if I was her. Because he doesn't really feel physical pain. Yeah, it's just... It's the old, how many times can you give a jump scare and it still work? But see, he's just so weak that I she's... No, see... but it works. That's what I'm saying. It's... Remember how, how Michael kills the officer and he starts shaking and gaining his power? Yeah. yeah. Well, here is the same thing happening to Lori. As, as she's killing Michael, she's sort of gaining her own yeah. power. But she also feels like... Look how ma- his hand is like... She, you know, oh. but she's also stuck in this idea that maybe for him to die, she needs to die too. Yeah, that's true. That they are just too connected. Yeah, you're right. You know, no, of course, I, that's I Allison's that's job as a character in the story is to kind of keep reminding Laurie that you. God, you know, you're you exact. Worth. Oh my God, I hate mm, seeing knives mm, go across skin mm, like that. Mm. I know. Oh. How much blood can a guy? But it's the thing is, if you just if they they had just left it at this, where she bleeds him out and he supposedly quote unquote dies, yeah. well, everyone would have left the movie theater thinking, well, he's well, going to come back. So they 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 filmed multiple endings. I mean, there was something where they don't take him. Here's to another the... reflection. Go yeah. Ahead. 
to the trash compactor and I guess it ends at like a crematorium and you know they they keep they were going to try and set you up for some eh, maybe maybe not but then they decided they just needed to put a you know, well, this only a again a real end to look, it. Look, as we all know, as Halloween franchise fans, all this ends is this timeline. Right. The, of you could easily just go back to the to beginning, go then back then, to one nineteen yeah. uh, seventy eight again, again, you're, again you're, and start you're over. You're losing all your original people that you, if you're trying to involve anybody and keep any of those well, that's anchors. The thing. Like, it's what I hope this. It's gonna ends, have to be really new. What I hope this ends is I hope this is a definitive ending of the all the previous four timelines that whatever comes next starts a brand new mythology yeah. that's my hope and i know i said that and i've beat that drum through these episodes but that's my but, hope and but only only because they have to only because you know with they're, michael they're myers at its more. center it should really just be done <laughs> you know i'm really in my eyes but you know as a franchise they're going to keep trying to bring it back but you, you could let it you I, could finish i, I don't it here. know if it would work without it just being this this is it is what it is i, I, mean, I just know. think they should start a whole new mythology with michael myers give him a whole new everything and, and just see what you can do bring some new creative blood and new creative filmmakers and writers in and and just and, and establish something brand new a whole new reality for michael myers for the character but you know somebody else will will come up with some new reinvented way of rebooting old franchises and then they'll just sort of jump on that bandwagon yeah like i could see somebody doing like a gender swap thing where it's like oh, a female michael sure. myers or something like which would just be corny but i mean i could see it happening well you I can love just see it they're using a gimmick to 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 and he's up the, us, he's so. on the car the hood of the car like you do like like a deer yeah, like I understand the point they're trying to make here, but also, I mean, it wouldn't just never happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know. But whatever. Gotta get well, past again, that. Well, this is very... There's the boy from Kills. This is very... Look how much he's grown. I know. This is very impressionistic here, and again, I know, it's, I know. It's a big symbolic... Uh, and it's symbolic of the end of an the, era, the, the end of the franchise. Moving on and, and getting closure to this m madman that's, you know... Let me ask you right, this. When you were first watching years. this, weren't you waiting for him to sit up? One more time, right? Yeah. I was almost sure he was going to sit up. Like, something's going to happen. He's coming back to and life. And the mob just rips him to pieces. Uh, well, well, remember how the mob gets killed at the end of Kills? I thought that was going to be right. the ending. He was going to sit up, and then the mob was going to destroy him. But I actually really love this. I know you said you really didn't, but... I kind of love this. The yeah, way he's being passed I, I across know. the town. I don't know how people. I feel about it. Like I said, I don't know if there's a an ending to Michael Myers that I would ever feel satisfied with. It just might be one of those things that maybe I just don't like that he's dead. I I, 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 I totally get that. You know, I, I can see. I can. I can feel. Uh, that. I don't know. I don't know. It's. I don't know what the problem is here, but it's oh, just. Oh God, like, that's brutal looking. You can re really see the real emotion in Jamie Lee Curtis's face, not only in the character of Laurie Strode, but as an actress that's that's been a part of this franchise for now almost 50 years. We're here in, tw if you're in the future, we're here in 2023 recording this. Yeah. So it's been almost 50 years. Oh my God, this, I mean, look at this, look at this, watch and this. And I think they had one shot with oh, this dummy look at this, body look at and this. it worked perfectly. Oh, there's Look at how the, the head brain. explodes. You could see the brain for a second. I mean, there's no question that Michael Myers is dead in this movie. Oh yeah. You, you can't dispute that somehow. No. no. Unless... That homeless man was Michael Myers. <laughs> no, he's Two dead. quick things. He's dead too. The homeless man, yeah, he, well, maybe. The homeless <laughs> man states that he is Michael Myers, and Willie the Kid in an earlier sequence says well, something about whether or not this was even ever the real Michael Myers. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. What if the homeless man is Michael Myers? Mm -hmm. It's... It's interesting that she keeps the mask that we were about to see here at the end, it's right? One of, it's my, I was going to just say, that's my other major gripe you with this You feel film. like it's a seat. No, I, I, I wanted to see her throw the mask. After Michael himself is crushed in the machine, I wanted her to toss the mask in last. You know why I like it? Well, I feel I don't say I like it, but I think what they're doing there is it's... It's their way of making you feel like he could come back It's without by still also killing him. Like, that mask still exists. Somebody else can pick like, that thing up. Like, why keep that frickin' talisman I know. around? Of course. Why? Because it's it's a horror movie trope. 
I know. You leave one little dangling you thread. You've got to leave a thread. You're right. You know? Well, that's the thread. That exactly. Uh, the evil resides in that mask at the Wouldn't moment. Wouldn't it be dramatically satisfying, though, if after you watched her push Michael into the machine, and then she just tosses the of mask course. and see the mask destroyed? Yeah. I mean, I think that would have been cool. What do you guys think? I mean, what do you guys think of the ending of this movie? L- let us know in the comments section. I would love to hear that. And, you know, mimicking the end of the original with some static shots, but this time no breathing, it's silent, and then we hear a familiar song come back in. It's, it's, very, it's a very poetic mirroring uh, ending, you know what I mean? From and I like that Hawkins, Hawkins hasn't given up on her. No. He's still holding out hope that she can get past this. And, and you notice now he's bringing vegetables and not the meat. Remember, she threw him a can of vegetables that you should try eating more vegetables, and then he brings her vegetables. What a, what a, I love this little subplot, this little storyline between these two characters. I mean, he says, yeah, I was making a love story. And I I don't think it's just like the obvious Allison and Corey. Corey, it's, it's, it's a lot of things. It's It's sort of also in a weird way, and I know this is weird, but a love story ending between Lori and Michael Myers. Yeah, of course. Um, it's actually quite touching when you think of that. I don't know. I think it is. It was almost she was in love with this. She was in love with uh, her connection to trauma. Trauma. Yeah, exactly. She didn't know how to not. She was almost like a, the way the mm. way a, a heroin addict is in love with the needle. Yeah, yeah. Which is the truth. Yeah, yeah. You do. You fall in love with the needle. This goes where Allison yells at her kind of one point, right? Like this is you bringing this all on yourself. Yep. She kind of tells her. Yep. And there we go. Wow, 13 films we've done. We've gone through every existing Halloween film as of 2023. It's actually unbelievable to me. We've done it. And I remember the first day coming down into this basement to record the first episode and zero subscribers. We were literally talking to each other and talking to thin air. But we were just having the time of our life just like this <laughs> carried through all the way till now. When I listened to that first one every once in a while, it was so subdued because I think we never imagined people were, would, would listen? ever listen. And we thought it was just a conversation with ourselves. Uh, it's funny. It's, it's, been, it's been a heck of a journey. I really, again, just love you guys and every single one of you that has subscribed, has joined our Instagram community, has listened to the episodes, has commented, messaged, everything. You guys, it's been the most pleasurable and satisfying creative endeavor I think I've ever done in being a part of this Haddonfield Radio, and I've enjoyed literally every minute of it. And I personally would not have changed one second of any of these episodes. I've enjoyed it fully, and I've been living month to month, as I know Joe has too, to do these episodes, and and we're going to continue on. And I think it's time we talk a little bit about what the future holds. Well, well, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just really quick, though, yeah. let's reiterate before we announce what we're going to be tackling next that we're not necessarily done with the Halloween. No, we we can't stress that franchise. Enough. It's just you know it's not going to be what you're going to get every single month in terms of a movie that well, we review. Well, just in terms of the fan commentary exploration right. format we've been doing we're going to review we're other gonna, movies we're going to jump into a new franchise but, but there we, will be halloween specials 100%. along the way there will be 100 percent halloween content on the instagram page it's still going to be all we're trying a to part do, of what we do all we're trying to do is just bring in some new energy evolve the channel a tiny bit and and just open it up to to a lot of new angles and, and, and originally we intended this just to do these 13 films and that's it. But since it's grown and we've fallen in love with doing it, we just want to find a way to keep it fresh. And we get asked a lot by other people. You know, Probably what else the most are you gonna, often question. What else are you going to do? Are you going to tackle other stuff? And and so, yeah, of course, we, you know, we want to keep it going. If you guys are like listening to us talk about movies, there's plenty of movies we love that yeah. we will that we will gladly talk about. And so we just want to let you guys know for season two of Haddonfield Radio, which will be beginning in November of 2023, we will be bringing you the history, lore, and legacy of every film in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise featuring everybody's favorite magnificently murderous dream demon, Freddy Krueger. Exactly. So our thought on that is if you love the Halloween films, you most likely love the Nightmare on Elm Street films. The Nightmare on Elm Street franchise for me was really my gateway drug into horror as a kid. 
and Freddy Krueger was like some kids they grow up they want to be an astronaut they they want to be a race car driver or a fireman when I grew up when I was a kid I wanted to be Freddy Krueger <laughs> I was obsessed with Freddy Krueger as a kid and A Nightmare on Elm Street was really the first real ho adult horror film I ever saw and so and, and, and to me that franchise is just so interesting the the story of the history of the franchise itself is interesting each film has its own flavor a lot of interesting filmmakers behind the films and in Robert England is such a fascinating uh, actor and Freddy Krueger a fascinating character that evolves during the films but but I will say this the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise what we're going to be covering is seven films Nightmare 1 2 3 4 5 uh, Freddy's Dead the Final Nightmare uh, Wes Craven's new nightmare and finishing off with the 2010 Platinum Dooms Nightmare on Elm Street remake. So that's like seven are, films, are right? We, do we throw in the Freddy vs. Jason We, we could movie. potentially make it eight and throw in Freddy vs. Jason too. We might do that. <laughs> but generally that, yeah. but we, I think right, we right. see a season right. as, I'd say, 13 episodes. So that leaves a bunch of uh, episodes at the back end of season two which we're going to be covering a lot of really cool other movies which we'll, we'll get to then. Yeah, so this is yeah. going to be a really eclectic season, season two of Haddonfield Radio. Mm -hmm. And if you have films that you'd like us to cover, we haven't set in stone what we're going to do after Nightmare on Elm Street and those seven or eight films. So if you've got something you'd like us to cover, just please let us know, and, and most likely we will. Yes. So I hope you guys are going to be excited to, to follow us through the story of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise for season two of Haddonfield Radio. We've got a lot to say about that. A lot of really fun movies to cover. Yeah. And we will be continuing to talk about uh, Halloween as well. So yeah. I mean, if really, you're a strict Halloween fan, there's still going to be a lot to, to enjoy as well. But, you know, in a weird way, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street is one of the, the many products of the, the Halloween, you know, yeah, Halloween I mean, success. It's, Him, it's part of that and Jason Mount Rushmore and all that, of 70s yeah, the, the, and 80s. All, the slashers, you know, and, yeah. and it's really because they, the, the success from my, of Michael Myers that these other guys also like got Jason, to do their thing. Like Jason, Leatherface, they all really took off because of the success of, of Halloween. So, yeah, I'm very excited. I can't wait. Yeah. I always liked when they called him Fred Krueger in the first movie sometimes. Oh, there's so many I don't cool know why things. I, was I mean, the franchise that, is so interesting to me and, and, and like endlessly fascinating. We have a lot to say. But so that's anyway. just in terms of our fan commentaries episodes we'll be doing. That'll be starting up. Uh, season 2 will start up in November. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that, that help uh, give us support along the way over the last year. And, and stay tuned at the end. And we're going to have a little list of uh, all the people we want to thank instead of just sitting yeah, here and doing shout-outs. Yeah, instead of prattling outs. it on, just watch There's at the end. A lot of crazy little internet handles. It'll, it'll, it'll come off better in the written form. And if um, you don't see your name in there, just understand, we love you too. Oh, we love everybody. We're, we're just putting in some of the people that have really been really vocal you know, uh, in, 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 uh, along these uh, 13 films. A lot of people who private message us, and we have all those types of conversations. Yeah, people have that helped really, us with information and yeah, all sorts of stuff. It, it's, it's a great community that's that we've been able to lean on and uh, and you don't and also you don't have to wait till November for more Haddonfield Radio we will be back as usual in a couple of weeks time with uh, episode 4 of the Haddonfield Radio trailer park yep and we're gonna we're gonna hold off on exp on uh, uh uh, letting you guys know what two films are going to be covering for that episode, but they're going to be really exciting. And it's going to be one of, an episode that covers a vintage and a new trailer. We're, and, um, then a we'll vintage be doing, and a modern trailer, right. Yep, and then we'll be also doing Halloween movies again after that. But also around actual Halloween time, we, there will be a uh, special Halloween episode that we're going to put up where I believe we are going to do something live in front of the camera. Yeah, so it's going to be really cool. And You'll get, we'll actually be on camera for the first time for that episode. We're going to be going over just sort of some of our favorite moments from the Halloween franchise. So like I said, we're still going to be exploring and yeah. talking about and some Halloween And also for things. that episode, we'll be doing something that I love to watch in YouTube, which is we're going to do our, our personal rankings of yep. the 13 films. Joe and I will be going to descending order. I think, spoiler, you probably can guess what our, <laughs> both our number one would be for the Halloween franchise, but we'll, we'll go going to do our rankings of, of how we both feel the uh, 13 how they fall the 13 films yeah so there'll be a lot in that special halloween spectacular episode there'll be a lot of great content and that'll premiere if not on halloween right around halloween so october we've got a couple more videos to to bring up so october is not going to be an empty month we have plenty to look forward to if you like what we do here at yeah. haddonfield Radio. october 2023 for anybody who is uh, not listening 
currently. Yeah, right. If you're <laughs> listen, if you're a listener in the future, you can just go right into yeah, the next it episode. Should, it should exist. Go, you probably already heard all the Nightmare on Elm Street episodes. God only knows. And if you're a listener in the past. I don't know why you're listening to this. Your big problem is you've time traveled and you're stuck in the frickin' past. Oh, please find me. I have a few things I need to do. Yeah, there you go. All right, guys. Well, that's it. We've prattled on enough. This episode's probably four hours long. I know. But we love you guys. This has been one of the most exciting, fun, just fundamentally satisfying creative uh, endeavors I've ever been a part of. We love you guys. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed watching Halloween Ends with us. And we'll be back, like I said, next time in a couple of weeks, we'll be back with episode four of the Haddonfield Radio Trailer Park uh, around Halloween. We'll be doing that uh, Halloween spectacular episode. In November, we'll start a Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. So, yeah, that's it. We love you guys. Thank Not you for being here. Not going anywhere. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess until next time, my name is Christian White. I'm Joe Francazio. And as always, have a very happy Halloween.